And I'm Lenny Kluge. We are two immigrants living in Chile, bringing you information on news, cultural topics, travel, business, and more. The Chile Today podcast is the first ever bi-weekly English news podcast. For more information about the news topics you will hear today, check out our news affiliate, chiletoday.cl. If you have any questions, stories to share, or just want to say hi, message us on Instagram at Chile Today Podcast or email us at chiletodaypodcast at gmail.com. If you're feeling generous, rate and review us so that more people can find our podcast. So anyway, what am I having? Oh, uh, hey. Hey. Podcast. Hey. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm good. Woo. I'm good. I'm ready to record this this podcast. Ready to rock and podcast. Oh, no. That is this how it's going to be? smarter in my head. Is this how it's going to be? This whole podcast? Yep, yep. For the next two hours. Get ready. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Please, oh, no. yeah. <laughs> I, we haven't decided yet. We haven't uh, if this is going to be a two-parter. It just depends on how much Lenny talks. Yeah, yeah. Actually, just fun fact: usually these things like take like three hours during the good recording session. Then Pinguino takes the scissors to it. And yeah, yeah. He's not only ominously. three hours. Like I was leaving my <laughs> I was leaving my apartment today, and my boyfriend was like, "I'll see you tomorrow." Yep. <laughs> I'll be asleep when you get home. And then Pinguino deprives all y'all of this great valuable information that i depart in your collective faces well thanks a lot pinguino oh yeah yeah especially because lenny likes to talk about numbers and nobody gives Ooh, a shit stats nobody gives a shit and so pinguino's so like mean. just cutting them off <laughs> it's just like 10 minutes of him being like and if the 10 percent grade of of uh, i don't know anything about math I'm sorry. <laughs> It's got a lot of math there. <laughs> Greater than just this, 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 this other thing. This curve of pie or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. Lemon pie. Oh, I want some lemon pie. Oh, sounds good. Uh, so actually, tell Lenny, tell the people what we're drinking right now. Wait, are you forcing me into shameless self-promotion? Okay, yeah. fine, I will do it. Well, we, you, we are drinking, because I sprang around, a bottle of Proviant, which is the brand of organic refreshments that I'm importing from Germany, which is great. It's like a lemonade. It's, it's like a lemonade, but it's more. Oh, it's more than a lemonade. Yeah, no, it comes in seven great flavors, like mm, like passion fruit, orange, and cherry, pomegranate. My favorite is the apple. And apple, and got lemon, and got rhubarb, and, and it's sparkly, and it's mostly without sugar, and it's all made from fruit that come that were sustainably farmed and it's all sunshine and puppies and rainbows yeah, it's german it's it, yeah not everything german is sunshine but and this puppies is and rainbow. this is it's <laughs> nice fizzy rainbows german yeah and uh it's really delicious so if you guys want to try it because i personally really like it which is why i allow him to talk about it on the podcast so um, nice. You can contact us, and um, or you can contact Limoland underscore CL That's on right. Instagram. And if you tell them you heard about it on the podcast, you'll get a discount. I guess that's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> or no? No, that's fine. <laughs> This is how marketing works. Traceability <laughs> Bethany, and stuff. Be- Be- Bethany decided there was going to be a discount. <laughs> yep. Bethany just decided there was going to be a discount code. Before, before, <laughs> before talking to Lenny. So, I'm, and I'm not even selling the stuff Lenny is. <laughs> yeah, apparently you are a marketing manager now, so congratulations <laughs> uh-huh. for the job. Yeah, well, let's get to the news for today. Now how about we do announcement first? Oh, shit. Okay, yeah. Firsties. So, some events. First of all, um, if you're interested in any of these events, we're going to have the information on our Instagram, at Chile Today Podcast. Podcast, and on our Facebook, facebook.com slash podcast. And um, all three of these events are hosted by The Chistolas, which is a comedy slash event planning group in Santiago. Um, and if you guys know of any events, you can always message us on our Instagram or Gmail, and we will advertise for whatever you guys are putting on. So that's chilisaypodcast at gmail.com. Okay, so... First event is, what is it, Lenny? It's the Horrible Movie Night on February 17th. I don't really think we have to explain this again, do we? It's a, it's, we go watch a movie together and it's horrible. And I know that sounds like, why would you want to watch a horrible movie? It's really funny. Like, because it's not like you're watching a horrible movie by yourself. You're with a bunch of people, like you're meeting new people, you're laughing. Like, the whole point is to laugh, right? At the ridiculousness. right. right. Um, I don't believe that the movie has been picked yet, but it'll probably start around 7.30, and it's free at the Black Rock Pub, which if you've never been to the Black Rock Pub, it's 
an amazing, very like, very at home kind of pub place it's to go. Cozy. It's nice and cozy. I love it. They have darts. I like to play darts. Um, so that's on seventeenth. Of course, all of this is unless we go back into phase two, which we'll talk about COVID Don't in a minute. It. But if we go back into phase two, we'll announce those changes. And the next event is just a couple days later on the 19th, and that's at the Fiddler's Irish Pub near Metro Mon One Mont. And that is a bilingual stand-up comedy show where we'll have comedians in English and Spanish. And that will be, I think, I can't remember if it's 3,000 or 4,000 pesos to enter, but it's one of those two, so not too expensive. It's affordable. Yeah, it's, it's and then that money's going straight to the comedians and the, and the organization, so um, come out, have a good time, see people. Village is really also a great place. And the last one is my personal favorite, which is on the 26th of February. This is the Bilingual Trivia Night, where you have rounds in English and Spanish, and you can make a team of up to three people. And it's a really fun time. We just had one, very, very successful, and it's great. So much fun. It's a lot of fun. I love it. I love I love it. I also host it. Um, I wish I could play it, honestly, but I'm so good at hosting that I just... <laughs> Look at you. I know. I really am. Loving it, hosting it. Love, I, love, I love playing, but um, anyway, I do it because I want you guys to enjoy. Aww. Yeah. Such altruism. I know. I'm I selfless know. like it's that. Just, it's just who you are. I know. COVID news. COVID news. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yep, yep. Can't we can't have an episode without a COVID update? And things are not looking good, guys. Things are not looking good at all. Mm. As of January 27th, now today is January 28th, the Friday, the day that we record this. The last news update I got was on January 27th. You sound really, really morbid right now. Morbid? As, as of <sighs> January 27th. It was a long day. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that bad. Yeah, well, if you, if you think this was morbid, like, check out those numbers, because numbers is what I do. Oh, We've no. had 24,037 new cases in one day. You remember how we talked about, like, in the last episode that... I'm cutting out this. Oh, okay. Fine. <laughs> you remember that like, in the last episode we talked about that, like, uh, the experts were, like, expecting 15,000 cases And we were like, no way. Like, no way. 15,000? No and way. And now it's, like, two weeks later and we got almost, like, double as many. So that yeah. is it. And not only the, the amount of cases has increased, also the positivity has increased, too. <laughs> But hospitalizations are really, really low. That is something that... It's quite that stable, actually, yeah, because we're only at 86% occupation of the UCI beds, which is more or less stable. I see you. In English, yes, I in see English, you. Yes, in English, I see you. <laughs> I was like, yes, of course, as you see me. Like, what do you mean? I was like, oh, yeah, 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 of course. <laughs> yes, the ICU beds is only, an, like, only, quote-unquote, 86% occupation of the ICU beds, which is more or less stable because, like, two weeks ago was, like, 84%. Still, like, I also remember us talking about the positivity rate a few weeks ago, and you you weren't really sure whether, like, was that, like, 7% was a lot, and I was like, yeah, that's a lot. Now I really hope that 7% is really not a lot, if you compare it to what is going on today. What's the positivity rate again? 18.82%. Mm. My mother-in-law has it right now. Oh, fun times. I haven't seen her. Don't worry, you guys. I know you're concerned, but I haven't seen her. She just got back from the U.S., but she was negative getting on the plane, positive getting off the plane. So she either got it really, like, at the end of her trip or while she was in the airport. And planes are kind of an incubator for that kind of shit, no? I mean, with Omicron, it's like if you're going to fly, you're going to get it. Just, like, soon like you're going to get it at that point. For what, like two weeks ago or something like that, all the municipalities of the metropolitan region went back to phase three from phase four. I think it was just four. a week ago. This was has been a, a long, yeah, a long fucking month. Fucking weekend, okay. No, a long fucking month as well. Now, us rolling back from phase four to phase three, like on a personal level, there's really not much of a difference. Not for, like, not if you're vaccinated. Not really, yeah. Even if you're unvaccinated, which you shouldn't be anyway, but like the private gatherings are down from 50 to 25 people if you have a pasa mobilidad. Damn it, I cannot invite my 50 friends anymore over to my apartment. This is a real... This is a big bummer. Oh, man. Yeah, I know. Or that, from 20 that, down to 10 if you don't have a pasta mobile, which is still too much if I, if you ask I me. think that really more involves, like, weddings. 
There's also not much of a difference for bars and restaurants. Like the the or the Hopotemoko, the photo stays pretty much the same. They have to, I think, it's like if you're like on a single serving table, like single table, they have to, like the distance between one table and the next table is a little. It really there's really no difference. Yeah, there. I mean that's why the Black Rock, like their a photo doesn't really change much through phases because their inside is so small mm. that it sort of just stays the same because it's all about like for them the meterage right they don't yeah. have the big enough space to, to make more pe- get make more people what get more people in yeah so yeah it's like meter foot s- <laughs> <laughs> it's like meter foot square Me- meter foot <laughs> n- i'm not gonna <laughs> mad you guys <laughs> this is why we Those hired too, too few meter foot squares here mm-hmm. like, we can't we can't do that mm-hmm mm-hmm so yeah that's a lot of new omicron cases and also because of that uh, the primary health healthcare system is like on the border of collapse right now. Like we're not talking about the ICU, we're talking about the primary right, healthcare. Right, right, right. Like that's the thing because right now there's not enough pers- personnel or money to keep up with the spike in demand. You know? Yeah. So yeah, as I was saying, form. like the the government has announced a new contact tracing strategy, w- which could be summed up with uh, let's ease up a little bit on everything, <laughs> which is kind of weird, like. Right now, the okay is it, it is as follows. Like right now, positive COVID positive people need to quarantine themselves for seven days, counting from the first days of the symptoms or the positive test result. Really, no news there. The mobility pass will be disabled for the duration. I think there are so, there are a lot of people that don't know that. <laughs> like, if you are COVID positive and you're in the system, like mm-hmm. your mobility pass won't work. <laughs> like, no. don't even bother. And then that's a new thing. Now, it's their responsibility to inform people that they have been in contact with um, as from two days before the symptoms began or the day on which the test was taken. And I'm asking myself, whose responsibility was it before? Like, yeah. I, I did, because I don't think the government... I was just telling people myself, right. like, I, like, not that I had ed- ever had COVID, but I just meant like when somebody had it, they were just calling their friends and being like, hey, yeah, yo, exactly. I tested positive, get the test. And Nobody, was, no government agency has ever contacted yeah, me and, and been like, hello. But they got a lot of flack for exactly that point, which kind of made me wonder, okay, like how was it before? Like, is there something I didn't know? Like did, did actually like the, 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 the hospital, like, you know, or the medical center just Maybe they were supposed around. to, and this is Chile and the bureaucracy Maybe they is. check on you, I don't know. The bureaucracy is either very, very good or it doesn't work at all. Right. <laughs> so. so according to this new strategy, like the close contacts, like the contactos estrechos, as I say here, the, are those that have been in contact with the COVID-19 positive person and maintained less than one meter distance and no, no mask for you or used incorrectly. Also, this includes all cohabitants. So if, if you are then counted as one of these contactos estrechos, like you are then put on what they call COVID alert. <laughs> and those on How? COVID alert. How are you put on COVID alert? Do they give you a special hat? Uh, What's going on? No, no. Basically, they just assume that you know that you're on COVID alert. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like a it's You like a should badge yourself that you put, yeah. in, in mm-hmm. your heart know yeah. that like, you're I'm on, on COVID alert. I'm right on COVID now. alert. So basically, those on COVID alert right now, like they need to do a PCR or an antigen test five days after the contact with a a COVID positive person or immediately after, like, or immediately if they are symptomatic already. Now, the thing is, as I already mentioned, like for the PCR test, you do need a medical order and primary healthcare is about to collapse. So like you can get yourself an antigen test, but what if you don't have the money for that? That was also one of the points that like has been criticized. Yeah. Like you got to get your own test. Like what if you were like a, excuse the language, poor motherfucker who can't really afford this whole thing, like what you gonna yep. do? So I had two, two more practical things. Like the health ministry uh, has encouraged people to download the updated version of their mobility pass because the QR code of the old one will expire on January tw- 31st. Oh fuck, I didn't know that, yeah, thank no, you. Yeah, no, I just read that today because yeah, you might wanna download the new mobility pass anyway because it has like the, the booster shot there. The old one doesn't, but you would assume that the QR code remains the yeah, same. Yeah, because I have my it new It has remained pass. the same. And it will, but only until January 31st. So update your mobility pass. Go to uh, mevacuno.gov, I think. Yeah. And download the latest or version. I usually just Google, where can I download my mobility pass? And like, the first <laughs> link is like, download your mobility pass here. So. Thank you, Google. But in Spanish. 
claro, ¿dónde puedo realizar mi mobility pass? I wouldn't be surprised if Google just does the automatic <laughs> translation at some point, too. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, yeah. like, it's... Yeah. Fine. I mean, like, putting, like, where can I get my mobility pass? Probably would work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that could work, too. If you live in Providencia, or even more, if you do own a bar or a restaurant in Providencia, be aware that the mayor of Providencia, Evelyn Mate, has announced that they will double down on controlling compliance with the COVID sanitary measures in bars and restaurants. She has said that during the first two weeks of 2022, they've already checked more than 500 mobility passes and initiated 17 investigations that can end with a 15 million peso fine for the establishment in question. Yeah. So just make sure you check your mobility passes, I mean, scan any, them, not only look at them. If you own a, any sort of restaurant anywhere, scan mobility passes, come on, it's not that hard. So let's talk about the peso, the Chilean peso. Let's talk about the peso, let's money, money. Let's talk about pesos. Um, so this has been something that has been a topic, an interesting topic for Chile because we now have a leftist-ish president elect. And so people have been very concerned about the peso and the dollar and all of those things. So good news is that the Chilean peso extends world-beating rally after bold rate hike. That's the title of this article that I got a lot of this information from. So on Thursday, which was the 27th of January, the central bank unexpectedly delivered its biggest interest rate hike since Ooh, 2001 yes. and signaled borrowing costs will continue to rise higher than many investors had forecast. The currency rose 0.6% to 797.38 per dollar. Uh, as of 8.40 a.m. on Thursday in New York, <laughs> whatever that means. Okay, outperforming <laughs> most emerging market peers and extending its year-to-date advance to about 7%. The largest among all currencies tracked by Bloomberg. Oh, I guess I got this from Bloomberg. Okay, swap rates jumped <laughs> with the one-year contract <laughs> rising 40 basis points while stocks gained. If you know anything about stocks, there's that numbers for you. Um, so the large unexpected rate hike improves the currency's carry appeal, which means improves its it, it's improved and provides extra <laughs> fuel <laughs> to world beating rally. Investors have been piling on the peso this year, encouraged by the president-elect Gabriel Boric's recent market-friendly signals, which we're going to talk about with his cabinet coming up, including his decision to pick central bank head Mario Marcel, who I'm going to talk about in a bit as finance minister and his opposition to further pension withdrawals it means that if you have a higher interest rate in a country it's more attractive to put your money on a like savings account or something so basically people like outside investors might want to buy pesos because they get more higher interest rates on a safe investment like in savings look account. at you being old see he's in his yeah. 40s that's how he knows this yeah no, and he know. owns property so yeah do i i guess well, your wife does something like that okay Last year, the peso was among the worst performance in the developing world following 16.5%. Quote, our peso outlook has improved. Boric confirmed his modernation naming Marcel. The central bank continues to surprise, and now the peso is a higher yielder, said Juan Prada, a currency strategist at Barclays in New York. The aggressive rate hike signals fresh concerns over the ability to tame Chile's fastest annual inflation in 14 years amid record economic growth. So... High growth, bad economic stuff. Uh, since the prior decision in December, consumer price increases topped forecasts for the sixth conservative month. The recovery of the local labor market gathered steam and oil surged worldwide. Six conservative for six consecutive months. <laughs> it says. <laughs> <laughs> it's Friday, you guys. Consecutive. It's this like nothing new during these months. Like we stick to the old values. <laughs> consecutive months okay so uh analysts and traders surveyed by the bank see the cost of living rising above three percent yeah no shit sorry sorry target over the next few years oh yeah like we don't swear on this podcast oh yeah no we definitely do don't let your small children listen well i don't know too late too, too late so many small children are super into our <laughs> podcast we talk about interest rates mom i want to know about politics yeah Chile, there you go especially... politics in chile what sports is cabinet like okay so uh Three percent, definitely. My rent rose over three percent just this week. So anyway, really, everybody's been suffering for rents. Yeah, heard, Everything. Heard about that. Every, rents going up. Well, those are not going up. Salaries are not going up. Prices of everything. It's mm. been. It totally sucks. I know this is a worldwide thing. It just sucks. Yep. Okay, so we expect 
a rate hike of 140 basis points in March, and then to have borrowing costs held at that level for one or two meetings as they wait for signs that the economy and inflation are cooling off, says Sergio Clavoy, chief economist at STF Capital. Well, I don't know what STF Capital is. Do you? Sounds legit. It sounds important. Uh, on top of that, the recovery has also been spurred by the swift vaccination campaign against COVID-19, which has delivered booster shots to almost two-thirds of Chile's population. Maybe more. Mm. So the booster sounds... shot boosted the... Boosted the, the economy. Boosted the economy. Mm. The economy. Okay. Mm. The... <laughs> Damn it, Pinguino. The second highest tally Oops. in the world, according to Bloomberg's vaccine tracker. Uh, in Wednesday's statement, so that would have been the 26th, policymakers wrote that there's a high demand for labor and the bank credit and consumption remain strong. The same dynamism, 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 dynamism it, of it's, imports of all kinds of goods is worth noting. These factors, together with global supply, boots, bottleneck, and higher commodity costs, Capulted, Caput? <laughs> catapulted annual inflation to 7.2% in December. Um, basically everything's going good, but also bad. That's just the summary. <laughs> In <here>. a nutshell. <laughs> uh, president, the current president, Sebastian Pineda, is expected to appoint a new central bank head to replace Marcel before finishing his term in early March. So this guy will have a job for like seven seconds. So, uh, well, like, I mean, in 40 tomorrow, never mind. So he's going to p- replace Marcel before finishing his term. But would that mean that that guy would stay in that place or Boric? It depends, Pinguino says. Okay, so basically I'm just going to summarize what Pinguino told me. He spoke for 15 minutes. So uh, Pineda can appoint the new central bank head, uh, but apparently the central bank is supposed to be autonomous, but yet the president can appoint somebody. So I guess Boric could technically appoint somebody, even though it's basically it's wishy-washy. Uh, so anyway, going forward, policymakers are signaling that borrowing costs will reach 6.5% in the second quarter and 6.75% in the third, according to Martina Ogas, an economist at Euroamerica. The board will likely opt for smaller hikes unless there's another inflation surprise, she said. So it is uh, so good, looking good for the international investors, which I guess is a good mm. thing. Not necessarily looking good for the average folk here in Chile right now. Yeah. I mean, there's, so, there's always that trade-off with inflation. I mean, you have you have high inflation, which then basically makes, I don't know, I think I'm mixing this up with interest rates right now. What are we talking about? No, not even interest rate. We're talking about exchange rates. There we there go. There you go. That's what you're trying to say. That's what we're trying to say. You know, with the exchange rate, like you got, you got a weak peso, which makes it very attractive for like foreign investors to basically buy pesos which then in turns make it strong makes it stronger but then it makes it harder for us to export goods again it's just like you got to keep the balance like there's really no black and white there there's not there's not indeed so if you liked that then you and lenny will get along you guys can talk about numbers Ooh, i didn't even i didn't even say numbers don't tempt him <laughs> don't, don't tempt him. Okay, He'll start you talking about it. numbers. Okay. Well, what else you got? Well, the public transportation made the news oh again in gosh. more than one way. Again, stop charging me money, Chile. No. Well, actually, the first part of the news is kind of, I guess it's good news. It's exciting, at least, because as uh, on Monday, January 24th, new January. technologies, te- new technologies, technologies were implemented in the Transantiago system, which is not called Transantiago anymore, but it's called RET, I think. Yeah, RET. Yeah, which is the most boring name ever. I like Transantiago better, but anyway. So. We still still Transantiago for everyone. Everybody says Transantiago, yeah, even in the newspapers. That. Nobody says red. True that. True and, that. Or it's, it's like Transantiago, parentheses, red. Yeah, it's like how nobody calls Plaza Baguedano, Plaza Baguedano. Oh, only if you're Cuico. You call it Plaza Baguedano if you're Cuico. Yeah. It is like a, it's the like Cuicos a thing. The Cuicos don't even know where it is. I know, but it's like a th- <laughs> it's like the what you call Plaza, the, uh, pl- Plaza, we've talked about this before, it tells like your political position. Yeah, it's either bet. Plaza de la Dignidad, yeah. which is typically like you're, you're a leftist, um... Plaza Italia, which is typically like it's neutral kind of like, yeah. or like what you grew up with, Mao still calls it Plaza Italia only because he it's, it's just, a habit. Yeah. He, he went to the Universidad de Chile, so he was there like every day. And then, pero Plaza Vaquedano, that is like I am right wing. Uh, that is the, where the statue should be Man. that those delinquents tore down. <laughs> yeah, that's it's a it's a it's a statement. Thing. It's a statement. It's a statement. So I'm just gonna keep on calling it Transantiago then because that's it's a statement. <laughs> so they introduce these technologies who are supposedly going to make your life easier a little bit. Now there are three new newfangled things, 
right now. Newfangled. Yep. So with a new with a new app from Banco Estado, you can generate a virtual ticket in the shape of a QR code, which you can use to pay your fare. So the app links to your Banco Estado account and will automatically deduce the cost of the fare. You know what I'm saying? But don't bips. Okay, so but here's the thing, though. Banco Estado cards already have this technology in the actual debit cards. Yeah, but the idea is that you just don't even need a card at all. You just like you can just leave your house with your cell phone and that's it. Who's leaving their house without their cards? Well, I do sometimes when I know that I don't have to make any purchases. But yeah, I get you. Okay. It's, 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 yeah. It just seems like a waste of money to like implement right. something that uh, you already there, sort there of are have. A few, there are a few good points about this. Okay, I'm tell get me your to good that, points. Though. So now uh, it's also expected that like it starts with Banco Estado and it's expected that the other banks will participate in the system during 2022. Okay, so they want like another way banks. that will be uh, another way will be that Transantiago's own app called Cuenta Bip QR to basically create a separate account in which you can recharge your, which you can recharge with credit or debit cards. Like I like that. The app will also create virtual tickets in QR form. So it's basically the same thing that the Banco Estado thing does, but I guess but made by Transantiago. I don't, and I've looked for it. I haven't found. I I I, I, found it yet, I appreciate so. the uh, if it uh, well if it actually exists. I appreciate the idea of getting to like charge my beep at home because so many times I've been like oh, I'm gonna go take a bus this morning yep. and I have no money on my card and then I gotta sneak on a bus like a delinquent. Oh, and you know spray paint yeah, walls and stuff. Yeah, I have to buy a bottle of spray paint. Spray paint a wall Not and then get on the bus just to get to where I'm going. <laughs> it's it's just what you do. Like yeah, you, ha- you have pretty to. much have you to. Have yeah. to. You have to. Because otherwise it doesn't because count. Because it's like where do I charge? There's on, there's only buses here. I can't because you'd have to go to, in order right now to charge your bib. You have to go into a place yeah. to charge to these it. These totems, yeah. Exactly. And that will be the third thing because the second thing is pretty much the same thing that the first thing did with the Banco Estado. I didn't quite honestly. I didn't quite understand this whole thing, but like how the second one is different from the first one but the third innovation is the automatic recharge of the bip card so basically the user can define a minimum amount to be topped up automatically every night and that can be applied to traditional bip cards and qr codes and then also one account can incorporate more than five cards it's good for families right so the cards will be basically recharged with the nft tech of the cell phone you know the nft tech like when you have your cell phone basically like how the poor, bip card the poor works old people are they gonna phase out bip cards because the poor nope. old people okay they're not good. gonna phase out like gloria had made this clear they're gonna still yeah. but it's gonna make things easier for people who are not necessarily living in santiago for example you know that's one thing Ah, but if yeah. you have this whole thing, for example, if you have a bit part, and that's also what I was thinking, because I usually, what I usually do, I always keep like 10,000, like on the account, so to speak, mm-hmm. like always recharge it. And then when I know oh, damn, my bit card is empty, then I, hopefully I'm at a metro station and I go with oh, one of these right. totems and then just like recharge it automatically without having to stand in line, which has worked great. But then, as you just said, like it has happened before that there's no metro station close and then my bit card is empty and then su- that sucks. So... Basically, what you can do now is recharge this whole thing with your cell phone and your cell phone. Most of the cell phones have this NFT technology when you just basically get close to something and makes beep like the card. You know, you can recharge it like that. Yeah, it lets you enter. So you can do that on the website moviret.cl or basically just download the app from Red. And uh, as I said, like this is also great for people that live in the regiones, basically, sure. or people that are just uh, visiting, you know. Yeah, like if you're planning on taking yeah. a trip, I mean, I know a lot of our listeners are from the U.S. If you're planning on taking a trip to to Chile, you can probably go ahead and do that from wherever you yeah. are right now. No, you probably don't have a Banco Estado account, but if they roll out this whole thing where oh, you can yeah. basically download the app and create an account there and then recharge that with your credit card, that would be great. You don't have to buy like a stupid card. Mm-mm. Now, I always assumed, I assumed that the whole... Um, QR payment is not available on all buses because the thing is, it's not that you scan the QR code, but basically you create your phone creates a QR code which is being scanned. So they said they already swapped out seven thousand eight hundred like card readers in the buses. I don't I don't think that's the whole fleet. Oh, the the buses right now have like a digital. Yeah, like on the side, now. on the side. But all of them? I'd be surprised. No, I don't think all the of case. them. I'm just saying like a several of the ones. <laughs> yeah, only that, in the well-off areas. Right, the ones that have the, the new don't buses, buses, the electric buses. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. The places where they don't take buses. Yeah, Don Santiago. So as Pinguino just clarified, no, not all the buses have changed to card readers yet. Hashtag which, not all buses. Yeah, hashtag not all buses, which doesn't surprise me in the least. But yeah, but actually, one big thing that I was asking myself is, why didn't they make better use of the NFC technology? 
like the the whole what thing is the the NFC technology is what these cards have. Like you get close to a reader and makes beep. Like cell phones have the same thing. Like basically, I use on my cell phone, for example, I use Google Pay, which is linked to my credit card. So every time I want to pay something, I just dish out my cell phone, put it on the card reader. Like the cell phone can do it. So why can't they just make a beep app? Which basically serves as because the beep we're in card. Chile, Lenny. It's still, it's still we're in because everything has to be okay. Now, the, okay, look, listen to me. Like the thing with the QR code is okay. That's a great technology, but it still takes a bit longer. Like you have to it has to be well aligned. The thing has to be. This, right. Imagine there's rush nothing hour. more Chilean than something that could be easy, <laughs> but we need it to take just a bit longer than it should. Are you making a lot of friends here, man? <laughs> I mean, I love Chile. <laughs> but that is the most Chilean thing I've ever heard in my life. Only 70% of Chile Chileans have access to cell phones. <gasps> okay, which doesn't really make sense if you think about the whole QR thing anyway. You know, like they may have just implemented an NFT solution from to, 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 to begin with. You know what I'm saying? Just link the BIP card to the phone, hold your phone to the card reader, it makes beep. You know and what, there we go. You, the reality, Lenny, is whatever they're doing, there's probably some sort of contract that the Wouldn't government signed. would be surprised. Yep. That is what happened. Wouldn't the, be surprised, yeah. My mom has a saying, behind every dumb law, there's someone making money. Yep. Yep, yep. So they signed a contract with somebody, and yeah. that's what's happening. No, anyway, these things were made to make our life easier. These and like, things were made the for whole, walking. True. No, no, no. Actually, no, for taking a bus. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, on the whole, I think those are good ideas, but the ODECU, the uh, Organización de Consumidores y Usuarios, Consumer and User Organization, sounds so weird. I think it's like the BBB in the U.S., the Better Business Bureau, in a way. Oh, okay. So they have voiced privacy concerns regarding the QR code system. Pinguino, you just mentioned that off air, I think. So according to the organization, the terms and conditions to use the QR code system are in part, and I quote, draconian, abusive, and violate the current norms of data protection. Especially like three, three paragraphs. One is like Banco Estado can unilaterally, unilaterally end the service, which is well, okay. It applies to a lot of things. Yeah. Banco Estado can unilaterally modify the terms and conditions and request the user to submit uh, additional documents to comply with additional requisites. It's also, like this is also something that that's really, any private company. Yeah, that's can any do private that. company. That's like Facebook. I mean, come on. Like, okay, if you don't like it anymore, then okay, then use your bit. Don't. Yeah, that's. I it. mean, I, I totally agree that I think this might be a violation of privacy, especially anytime you have like a tracking situation going on. Yeah, yeah, but hold on. Like, that's that's the thing. Like they should say, okay, we're changing this thing. Now you agree or you no longer participate. Right, right but who reads yeah. the changed terms and conditions? Yeah. No one. And this is where the third point comes in. They say the client, ex and I tried to translate it, the legalese, the Spanish legalese to English here, the client accepts to reveal personal data such as <gasps> location, okay, IP of the cell phone, uh, browser history, like they no. said like historial de navegador which is like hold on let me watch my porn while i'm riding in the metro i'm just and kidding nobody ever the, do that that no. is do, nobody ever do yeah, that who watches porn anyway and all the data <laughs> only real evil people <laughs> only bethany only and me. all the data that might be considered necessary to inform the respective authorities of payment delays this, and to incentivize the client by offering them new benefits up. and or products to no. stimulate the use of payment service offering by the bank third parties or as a requirement, requirement no, by the company I don't authority like this. No. this is I don't a like lot this. of no, nope, nope, nope. No, because imagine, imagine, okay, you are somebody who is, like, let's say you're a 19-year-old, right? You're coming home from school, and you just happen to have bipped in where there is a large protest. And they then set the metro on fire, right? Or, mm -hmm. you know, somebody unrelated to the protesters at all has set the metro on fire, but they're like, oh, no, it was the young people. And then they gather all of the data of anybody who bipped into that station around that time. You are automatically suspected of being involved in a crime that you might not have had any involvement in just because you were there, and yep. they can track that you were there. Not yep. cool, man. And also, like browser history. I hope I didn't like. This is not a mistranslation on my part, but browser history. Like, the fuck you want with that? And like, where does this gonna end up? Like, my insurance company. I mean, <laughs> my insurance does not need to know how much porn I watch. Yeah, yeah well, whatever. Like, if I look into I like bungee jumping or... I like true crime a lot, you guys. I love true crime oh, podcasts. Maybe the PDI should get their hands I know, on that information. And what if they do that? There goes my visa. Mm -hmm. Like, Bethany looks up crime scene photos all the time. Yep. Not This is completely separate from my porn. These, these things do not overlap, I promise. <laughs> That's what she said. 
<laughs> I that's what she that. said, right? I just want to make I just want to make that clear. Mm-hmm. My true crime. Like anybody believes you right now at this point, but they, okay, it's nah, fine. Nah. <laughs> but yeah, a whole lot of nope in that paragraph. So that's I think they really have to work on that because I'm gonna this stick is, with my this ain't cool. b- with my bip. Okay, so the famous the famous PGU the Pagu. Pagu, which could be an animal name. The Pension Garantiza Universal. Was it that? I already forgot about the... The Universal Pension. The, yeah, the Universal 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 Guaranteed Pension has been signed into law. So yeah. it had bounced back from... Well, it went first to the, the lower house and the upper house and got bounced back to the lower house for whatever legal reason. I don't know how that works, but apparently this time it yeah, had to go back to the lower house. Yeah, because it, it was sent back for rewriting. Gotcha, gotcha. So yeah. And it got sent back and it was approved anonymously. It got approved unanimously with 122 in favor and none against, uh, which is surprising because there's been a lot of like controversy about this whole thing. But apparently this law, has, which has been promulgated by our dear comrade Pineda, oh <laughs> which has been very left-leaning lately, like towards the end of his term, which is kind of funny. Uh, very left-leaning? Not very, but like there were a couple of things to be like, really? Really, Pineda? Really? I mean, not that I'm against him, but this is really not your handwriting. So it's kind of funny. I think he's just checked out. Yeah. He's just like, eh. You probably go like, you know, what the fuck, you know. Not wear a mask at the beach. Just like, I hope I can pass a few laws that people don't lynch me in the street, you know. So this will come into effect. Please like me. Please like me. (laughs) Please like me. Don't Uh, hate me. No more photo ops in in Plaza Baquedano. So, yeah. He probably doesn't even know what the name of it is. (laughs) Probably, yeah. So this law will come into effect as of February 1st. Now, eligible are old people, people over 65, old people, yeah, which means that I'm not an old person yet, so I'm, because I'm 40, like, don't you dare say it. I didn't say anything. Now, I'm these, sitting here next to my these microphone saying old nothing. people over 65, they must not belong to the t- uh, 10%, per 10% wealthiest of the country, which is, I think is such a better way to put it than the 90% most vulnerable as most articles put it before which is yeah. just like such a weird thing to it's like oh, I belong to the 90% most vulnerable it's like yeah you're not Jeff Bezos I mean like, no but honestly I think it's a I, I know what you're saying but at the same time highlighting the fact that 90% of the country is basically one paycheck away from being homeless is like an actual thing that needs Actually, to be emphasized. I, I, w- I would like to see the numbers of that because I wouldn't be surprised if somebody with like a like a, like a 1.5 million income is still in that bracket. I, I don't know for sure, but I wouldn't be surprised. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of yeah, a weird way the, of putting the pro- it. The problem, the, the problem in Chile is that even if you make 1.5 million uh, a month, mm-hmm. the cost of rent... And the things that Chileans are spending their money on, they're spending way more than they should be spending on what they're... Yeah, but I mean, um, okay, imagine you're making $1.5 million, okay? But you're paying how much money? Like, what, 800000 pesos in rent? That's a shit ton. That's a shit ton of chunk of your, of your paycheck. Yeah, no, I get that. But, okay, well, I can't really talk there because I don't live in a rented place. Because mm-hmm. so he married a, a, a lady who bought her property before the spice. It sounds like I did it only for that. <laughs> yeah, that's the only reason why he did it. Yeah, he told me off mic. Yeah. No, I, I get you, but still, uh, I mean, okay, hold on. Let's just, let's, I mean, let's I, table I'm, this I'm conversation. Just, I mean, just, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. It's, it's, it's semantics, literally semantics. But I think that the fact that really the majority of Chileans, even if you make $1.5 million now, if you lose your job, you're fucked. Right. If you get a divorce, you're fucked. If your spouse dies, you're fucked. I think the fact that vulnerable is not a bad way to describe the fact that the majority of Chileans are holding on maybe by their nails or by one hand. Yeah, not necessarily the nails, but one hand. But OK, gotcha. Semantics. So if you are if you qualify for this. And if you receive a pension of less than 630,000 pesos, you will receive the full amount, which is 185,000 extra. If you have a pension that is between 630 and 1 million, the subsidy will gradually diminish, you know. You have to have lived in Chile for at least 20 years, consecutive or not. And that How long have you been living here? Me for like 15. And this is counting from the 20th birthday and having lived in Chile for at least four years during the five years prior to the application. This is very complicated. Now, foreigners can also receive the PGU support. They have to have they been here for 20 years. Exactly, consecutive or non-consecutive. So, like, if you if you immigrated to Chile when you were 50, 
you're fucked. Yeah. Great. Well, Thanks, Pineda. Okay, like this is, but this is a subsidy, right? Like you are still eligible for whatever other payments there are. I mean, not only AFP, there's also Pila Solidario. There's but, like, but uh, if you, for example, like let's say you're there's a giant war that breaks out in Argentina tomorrow, mm-hmm. right? And you're 50 years old and you come here, you contribute to Chile for 10 years mm-hmm. or whatever, how long until you retire, mm-hmm. you're fucked. And you, I mean, you, you will not receive these 185,000 extra. That's true. And then you don't have any amount of money put into an IFP except for what you've been like working well, for, for the past ten or thirteen years. Well, there are other welfare programs that I'm not really privy to, right? Like there's like the Villa Solidario. There is a couple of other things. Like I'm, I'm not really, I'm not an expert on the inner workings there. How dare you? I mean, I do. I mean, I do get that. Like you cannot come no, here for I like understand. a year, and like you, no, you no, have no. to help finance this whole thing too, right? I, but. I, I know what. I know the reason why they do it. It's just like maybe there's a little application process first. I don't know. I'm just thinking of yeah. like. I don't know. I mean, they hammered it out between Senate and, like, the upper house and lower house. I guess there were a lot of, like, uh, yeah, and conversation, I am discussion sure, going on. I am so 100% sure that this is going to be, this is going to morph and change as we go into um, well, it's gonna, the it's, new it's, constitution and the new government and be, all of these things. But the law stands. So, as of today. It does today, not sit. In, nice. As in three, four days, the first people gonna first people going to receive their, their benefit there. People already receiving welfare payments in form of the Pension Básica Solidaria and the Aporto Social Solidario, they will receive funds as of February, which covers like the 60% most vulnerable. And for the 60 to 90% most vulnerable, there will be an evalu- evaluation process that can take up to six months, up till August. And then they basically, what the, the bureaucracy is figuring out, okay, uh, how much are we going to give you because you're there not receiving the full amount there. What really caught my attention is that this whole thing didn't go to the Constitutional Tribunal because if you remember, the I think it was Rodrigo Cerda, the current finance minister, he was like, bop, 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 bop. you're not going to change this whole thing because like they wanted to finance this whole thing by basically uh, closing loopholes and touching the tax code. Don't and, touch that. And he was just like, nope, that's the president's r- prerogative, so don't touch because this is going to go to the, uh, to the mm-hmm. Constitutional tri- Tribunal. And apparently that's not the case now. So I guess he backed down. Yeah, I mean, uh, maybe when something's unanimous, there's an exception there. Could be, could be. Diego knows what. The executive has, has to actively push it towards the yeah. constitutional. And they don't care. And, yeah, and since it's Pineda's thing, so yeah. yeah, I guess he. And he, as he said, just said before, he just doesn't care anymore at this he point. He doesn't give no shit. Yeah. He's so right. Now you rem- you you might remember the whole discussion about how to finance this whole PGU project yeah, and that like was one of Boric's concerns. Yeah, and that was the whole thing. And uh, apparently they managed, and I think they they did reach that goal and then some, you know, by closing loopholes, by doing away with tax exemptions, and so on and so forth. Basically, just if you will, taxing the rich. Good. And actually, that goes nicely hand in hand with a study that just came out by the Fundación Ciudadanía, which basically says that the richest only pay 6% when they should pay 35%. I know, I Have you read about that? Today. I saw that today. So that was like, wow. You no, know? and I, again, know this, my best friend works for a law firm that mm. literally one of their jobs is to make sure rich people don't pay a lot of taxes. Like, that's one of their jobs. Yep. We're going to help you not contribute to all the things that you're taking money from. Yep, yep. So... That's the thing right now. So they only pay 6% on their income where they should pay 35%. But yeah, let's up that price for that. And, okay, they got the, this, like in this article, they got this weird way of presenting those numbers because they said, with well, oh the funds God, evaded. Numbers. No, but just very, like a few. They said, like, <laughs> <laughs> with the funds evaded by the individuals, the state could have purchased 70,000 ventilators, more than 70, 26 million basic food baskets, and 32 hospital beds. And with the funds evaded by the companies, the state could have purchased. 274,000 ventilators. So they're dividing up the... It's, uh, it's just like, just give me the numbers. Those, yeah, they're dividing just give me, <laughs> like, those numbers in a weird way. Yeah, it's just like, we're just like, give me the... Ca- like, how, how many pesos, how many million how billions many? of pesos are we talking about here? Right, exactly. Like, don't make just, me do the math. No, so. I agree with you. That's a weird... Yeah, but I mean, it's still it's still very impactful because, you know, they say, like, they could have, like, built, like, 129, like, gig hospitals and, like, pay the salary of, like, 170,000... We med- could have a state-owned for, owned just, private yeah. bus system. Or, no, state-owned private bus. That does not make sense. Yeah. So, so, if you're interested in looking that up, there's actually a website called dataigualdad.com. 
which kind of exemplified nice. their findings a little bit. Yeah, that was it was uh, I spent a little time on that, and they I mean they still had this weird way of presenting their numbers, like with all these funds we could have bought all that. Just give me the fucking numbers, man. But how, mon- how many billions of pesos was it? Yeah, no, no, it's just, yeah, I I couldn't find that information. I mean, I could have dug a little deeper, but I don't have all freaking day, you know. But it was impactful. Just trying to sell some sodas, people. Limoland underscore CL. Hey, on Instagram. That yes, was absolute non sequitur, but I appreciate it. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm there for you. And if this whole thing wasn't enough, another apport by the Sepal or Eklak, is it? No, I like Sepal, but it just sounds just <laughs> nice. It just you rolls say off Eklak the like a German. Like Eklak. <laughs> so, <laughs> what does that mean? What does it mean? So they found that while Chile is that. not among the worst Latin American countries when it comes to the growing number of people living in extreme poverty throughout the last years. However, Chile is among the lowest Latin American countries where inequality has risen disproportionately strong throughout the pandemic. Right, mm. and we are one of the one of the top countries in the world with the biggest disper- disparity between um, rich and poor. Yeah, yeah, that was basically yeah. the point. I mean, in the, the Gini world, coefficient. Though. Yeah, though I did look it up with the Gini coefficient. We're not that far. I mean, I thought it was worse. It's there are like I think China is the worst. I think Mexico is even worse than, than really. Chile yeah, that wouldn't like that. that wouldn't but surprise the me. The point there was like this has gotten worse on a latin american level during the last years during the pandemic makes so sense. kind of makes sense on the bright side like minister of labor noted that 90 percent of the jobs that have been lost to the pandemic between december 19 and march 2020 have been recovered yeah that's that's good the the, rec- the job recovery right. has been speeding up but a lot in chile Boric better make this work because i mean with everything that's coming work this it. way right now this whole thing with the uh, with the pgu the whole thing with the metro that's my the metro and micro fares that's gonna it's gonna rise like he has to close those loopholes and get the funds but, he needs to find us the world because he recently he's spoken out against the fifth i don't know why the fifth but the fourth withdrawal from the pension yeah. funds which is basically a 180 degree turn and has potential actually to become the first big internal conflict of his administration because big parts of his coalition are in favor of this. As well, like I don't know. Of, well, OK, so we can talk about this more as we start talking about the cabinet. But not a lot of people in his coalition support the fourth withdrawal. The fourth withdrawal. A lot of people on the left support the fourth withdrawal. Um, Marcel, I believe, going to get to this a little bit more later. There's a lot of people that say, like, no, because what we're doing is we're continuing to take money out of the IFPs. And that's the whole part of the problem. People don't have IFPs. This should be fixed in a different way. Yep. Yep. And so that's what he's sort of coming out against. And yep. a lot of, and, a, and his cabinet is in support of that. They're like, look, we, people are down to the, the scraping the, the bottom of the barrel here. Yep. This is not sustainable. Yeah, no, no, and I agree. I agree with that. Actually, I think we've talked about this a few months back, and like from the beginning. I mean, I was also very wary about this. I mean, okay, I see this is a quick fix. Okay, this is great, but this should be a little bit more differentiated to like only allow the poorest of the poor to withdraw the funds, which is a difficult thing to control and to measure. But then again, I mean, Boric himself knows that. Okay, this is as he said, like pan para hoy, hambre para mañana. You know, so yeah. it's not sustainable, as he just said. So they yeah. need to fix this in a different way, and one way would be to close these loopholes, get away with these yeah, exemptions. Yeah, and and I'm excited to talk to you in a few minutes about yeah. his cabinet because I think that some of his picks are were very wise, not necessarily picks that were like in his best interest, but picks that were wise to accomplish ultimate goals. To yeah. close loopholes. Anyway, we'll talk yeah. more about that in but a few minutes. But you want to talk about ketchup now, don't you? I'm going to talk about ketchup, you guys. Woo. Okay, so the world giant Kraft Heinz opens its operation center in, for South America in Chile. Actually, right down the street, they're opening their office in El Golf, which is kind of cool. And maybe they'll give us free ketchup. So I couldn't be standing on the company's roof because I'm afraid of Heinz. <laughs> Thank I you. hate you. <laughs> That's nice. That's nice. Oh boy. Okay, it's so weird. Chile is actually one of the biggest consumers. It is the biggest consumer in South America of ketchup besides Brazil. So <laughs> that's such a random <laughs> fact. So that's one reason. Something to be proud of. <laughs> <laughs> we like ketchup. Um, so it's like I said, it's opening up its uh, center in El Golf in Las Condes, and it's going to be in charge of business in Peru, Argentina, Bolivia, Paraguay, Uruguay, Colombia, and Ecuador. And so this is also going to be providing jobs that weren't here before. Um, a lot of them, according to this article, it doesn't say a number. It just says many jobs. So, and it also says... Um, those many jobs, we could have bought so-and-so many beds so, and better <laughs> with, the, with those jobs, because we need to sell ketchup. 
Um, so the growth, according to the company, is not only a true reflection of consumer confidence in the brand, but also in the team, which has increased four times since 2020. Um, so the commercial manager of Kraft Heinz, Z Xavier Amaburu, um, said Chile assures that the formation of South America as a new business unit is a very good sign and the decision to make Chile the center of operations is a reflection of sustained growth and greater confidence in the long term. Kraft Heinz ties with Chile have been strengthened in recent times. The company highlights that from the market side in 2021, they carried out the first campaign that was born from Chile that became global, the Heinz Ketchup Burger, which I've eaten and I like it. It was held in 20 countries and later highly awarded at the ACHAP Awards, which I have no idea what that is. They won six golds and three Grand Prix. Is this a race so, but, with what burgers? Is it, what is that, like the Heinz Ketchup? Is it just a burger or is it like a... It was a burger. Well, what I think it is, what I think I ate, was like a frozen burger that had ketchup already inside it. Oh, oh so, so it was like a meat patty with ketchup inside it? It was good. What I ate was good. Maybe it's not what it is, but I, I think that's what it is. We ate that in the States? No, no, here. Here? Did here. you get that? <laughs> Where'd you get that? Where'd you get that? <laughs> <laughs> Where'd you get that? Amazon? Uh, at the leader, I think. Huh. The leader. Maybe I'm totally hallucinating it, but I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I don't and there was know. one like, with pickles I'm, in it, too. No, no, no. Like regularly browsing the like the, kind the of like burger section, like, so like like you know. the meat patty was mixed with ketchup. You know cool. what I'm saying? Cool. Okay, so the company is also making alliances with with what's called the Inspiring Girls Foundation, where six company volunteers participate in talks with school age girls in which they share their experience and aims to increase girls' self esteem and professional ambition. And they go from door to door and say, I "Sell don't ketchup know. burgers," or. But they, they're hoping, hoping what they have, they're saying that they have an optimistic outlook and they're, and they're excited about facing the new challenge, not only for Chile, but the entire region. So fun, fun story about Heinz. Okay. Do you know who John Kerry is? Oh, 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 he's, he's, isn't he like a, oh, hold on, you're spoon feeding this to me right now. Uh, the... I'm not saying anything. I'm spoon feeding it ketchup. That's right. No. <laughs> well, isn't he married to like the Heinz heir yeah, or something? Yeah, he's married to the Heinz heir. And it's funny. Yeah. So my family was very, very conservative um, in Arkansas. And so back when Kerry versus Bush, because John Kerry ran for president against George Bush. I remember right? that. Right. And it was like days. the whole like dangling chad or whatever. No, what, what was it called? <laughs> the dangling chad. <laughs> Hanging ch I see hanging chad. See, it's a thing. <laughs> that sounds like a euphemism for <laughs> I something know. else. I said it and immediately was like, oh, no, that can't be what it's called. But it's called a hanging chad. Okay. With the whole, like, oh, controversy. It's a thing. It sounds horrible. <laughs> hey, could you take it care of really my dangling thing. chad for me? There is definitely a porn called the hanging chad. <laughs> dangling chad. <laughs> okay. So, anyway, so my parents are really conservative and they voted for Bush. And I was like, I was a child when all this was going on. But I remember... My my mom only once in her life ever boycotted something, and she boycotted Heinz ketchup, which sucked because the only other thing was Hunt's ketchup, which does not taste the same and is not as nope, good. Sir. It is not as good. Oh, you might have a lot of ketchup opinions since you're German. Don't uh, Germans have specific ketchup? No, like ketchup is quintessentially American. Really? Like you you guys don't you have like we German got, ketchup? We, I mean, probably there is, but you know what's the most popular brand of ketchup in Germany? Heinz. Yeah. Nice. But not mustard, right? Mustard's a whole different. Yeah, no, mustard is a different ball game. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, that's our news, everybody. Ketchup. Okay, wait, stop. Again. 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 Talk. 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 Talkity talk. Talk, talk. <laughs> like, really, these mics do what? I think they have, like, a life of their own. What is that? Yeah, I think it's the cable. Ah. There's, like, two more holes in the other mic. Talk. I think it's that small of a thing. Hold on. Okay. We're recording, correct? <laughs> okay, so, as usual, we're going to do two parts. <laughs> as um, usual. With this going over the cabinet 
We have several ministers that we're going to go over today, what they do, why they're important. And we want to make sure you guys are getting enough details, so we're going to do this in two parts. It's not like these ministers are going to go away anytime soon. Oh, hopefully not. I mean, yeah. if, it was the, <laughs> if, if it was the Pineda's government, who knows? Okay. Wait, that was a mixer. Oh right? Oh, God. Remember? Oh, no. Recording, <laughs> recording Binguino. Oh, yeah. No, it's just that uh, there's um, a while ago, back in the early 1900s. I'm sorry. It's, 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 it, it'll make sense in the end. Okay. Um, there was a par uh, their constitution back then was very par um, gave a lot of power to the parliament, where you could remove a minister. When you say 1900s, you mean 1900s, not the 90s, like large and Jesus, right? Yeah, the late 1900s. Nah, uh, <laughs> you remember back in the days? <laughs> no, no, the early 1900s. I'm talking between a 20th eight, century. Between 1891 uh, and 1925. 19th century. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 19th not the 1900s. 19th century. Okay. Uh. So anyway, uh, the par and Parliament only needed a simple majority to be able to remove a minister, so it was very easy to remove them. Oh, God. And the president, Baros Duco, same guy from Spanish, <laughs> he had 27 mi interior ministers within six years? No, five years. Oh, my God. Yeah, five year, five year. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of them, yeah, five year presidencies, uh, ministers coming in and out. To the point where a lot of them they just ran out of people. Oh they my god! They just had to like grab people from like. Uh, That's like a brothel. But even, like... even Trump can't keep up with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. Are we still recording? Yeah, yeah, we still we never stopped. Okay, so um, I'll start because <laughs> you're chewing on chips. Mm -hmm. But I'm gonna start with Mario Mastel. He's yeah. super super important. He is going to be. The new Ministro de Hacienda, which is translates to the Minister of Finance. So he was who I talked about earlier in the news section about how his, like, the naming of him as the finance minister really, like, shored up, in, like, the confidence mm. of a lot of people um, because of things I'm going to talk about in a second. But I'm going to highlight what is the Minister of Finance and his responsibility. So the Minister of Finance... Finance, okay, has the task of directing the financial administration of the state, proposing the economic and financial policy of the government in matters of its competence and carrying out the coordination and supervision of the actions that are executed by virtue, virtue of it. In addition, they must, this is all from the government website, so oh, that's is why I'm reading. In, in addition, they must prepare the draft budget of the public sector and dictate the rules for its execution, manage financial resources of the state, Obviously, this is all really important stuff. Propose, propose the legislation related to the administration of the personnel of the public sector, and especially that referred to endowments, rem, remuner, remu, oh, remunerations? Am I saying that right? Yeah. Retirements, yeah. pensions, and um, and things of that nature. Um, Organize financial actions carried out in their respective spheres of competence by the different ministries and their dependent and related agencies. Known and inform before the beginning in its legislative procedure any financial initiatives that imply expenses or indebtedness of the public sector. Intervene in international, commercial, and financial agreements and treaties. Exercise the power of rights conferred on the Ministry of Finance by the Constitutional Organic Law of the Central Bank of Chile. A lot of stuff. He be handling the moolah. Yeah, he, money. Lots of money. But it's, like, a lot of responsibilities here. Yeah, no kidding. I'm like, how have I not, like, heard so much about the Pineda's finance minister for as much mm. shit as they have to do? I mean, it's just, I don't know. My, in, my, in my personal experience, like, this whole, like, if you read through a job description, it really just looks very scary. And then, in a way, like, everything kind of, like, dovetails into another. You, you know what I'm saying? It's just, like, it looks like a lot. I mean, it is a lot of stuff. Like, being being a minister is no, no cakewalk. But a lot of these things that you just described are probably going to just, like, dovetail nicely into one another and one is part of the other one. Oh, absolutely. But I feel like we're going to hear way more about Marcel than we ha would have heard about Piñera's minister because there's going to be a lot of moving and shaking with the finances in Boric's government. Or there should be, according to both yeah. Marcel and yeah. Boric. Yeah. So, who is Mario Marcel? I'm going to call him Mario. Mario. So <laughs> he's <a> me. <laughs> it's a M. Okay, so he's a Chilean economist, and he was the governor of the Central Bank of Chile, and he was named the government in 2016, and he had been, and he has been, and currently is on the bank's board, starting in 2015. 
the central he, bank. The central bank, yeah. yes, the central bank of Chile. Um, so he has been a close a close collaborator to the government of the left center concertation parties for democracy, which has been like Bachelet's government um, and her coalition. But he's currently an independent. That's how he identifies as his party. He's an independent. Um, so he held in the constant in the Bachelet's government. He held posi- p- the position of budget director and played key roles in the design of structural surplus rule. He's one of the big reasons for um, the establishment of faith, as I mentioned earlier, in um, Boric's government. Um, he studied at the National General Jose Carrera High School. Nobody cares. And Business Administration at University People of Chile. People care about the high school. Okay, here. in Chile they do. Okay, so that was General Jose Miguel Carrera High School in Santiago. Is that where you studied, Pinguino? No. Oh, okay. No, I like Jose Miguel Carrera. Oh, okay. No. He graduated as the best student of the class. He had received a master's degree in economics Nerd. from the University of Cambridge in the UK. Okay, so that's a little... Uh, there's so much more about this dude. Uh, he's got a lot of experience. Um, he worked with Patricio Alwin. Alwin? He was uh, in 1990. Um, and Alejandro Foxley as the Minister of Finance. Um, and Marcelo joined the government as advisor for macroeconomics for Alwin's presidency and uh, other social programs. And he was in the position of deputy budget director. Okay, so there's a lot more stuff I go into. He also worked for Edra F- Eduardo Frey in the presidency. He worked and he was the director of budget for Arellano. So there's like, he's worked with a lot of like important politicians. He's got political clout and experience. Like there's like a whole paragraph of here of all the people he's worked with, but I'm not going to go into it because nobody, I mean, if you guys want to know, I'll just email it to you, whatever. Here's the link. But... Um, he, um, okay, I already said he worked with Mathieu Bachelet, um, cut some of this out. No. There's so much. And I thought I edited it too, I edited a lot out. Ah, okay, so here we go. So he's worked, like I said, he has a lot of clout, and, but something interesting is that our favorite communist mayor of Recoleta, uh, Daniel Jadwe, had some words about um, about Marcel. Jadwe specifically was like, ooh, Marcel, he's a neoliberal yep. turd. He said, we all know that he's a defender of the neoliberal creed. Yeah. M- Marcel has worked with a lot, a lot of different governments not right-wing governments, but a lot of different governments from the moderate to a little bit more left. He has been involved in a lot of that. And Holloway does not like that. Holloway is the communist and also very proud. If, if you've ever heard Holloway, he's a very proud communist. Yeah. He's very, he has a stick to of what he right. thinks is right or wrong. And um, he's not happy about Marcel. Yeah. I guess he's, I think he just really tried to entrench himself there in his, in his because as you said, like the choice of Marcel was just widely applauded from all all sides Everywhere. it was just it was just bolts eye and then some because and i mean if you remember in our last episode we talked that like the the finance ministry is like the ministry position that needs to be like that is like the critical position right. that needs to be filled I mean, to stabilize the market like, oh, yeah exactly like, to just everybody calm the fuck down and everybody did and everybody did and like even like the stock market went up by like almost four percent like the dollar dropped below and like it was like oh you know, spur of the moment thing. Everybody was happy. Even like this guy. Uh, I don't know if he got this written down. You know, Juan Pablo Suet, who is like the National Entrepreneur Association guy. He sang high praise. I mean, he, he has been. He has worked with a everybody. lot of government. He's. I mean, not only has he worked specifically with leftist governments, he's worked with the central bank. He's been involved. And even Hathaway, as strict as Hathaway is mm-hmm. about his politics, even said that it's very likely that the Marcel we know is not the Marcel we're going yeah. to see as of March 11th. So even Jadwe was like, you know what? I think that this guy is going to do a good job. 
or that's at least my interpretation of what he's saying. Like, yeah. I know that he's got this neoliberal streak in him, but I, I, I think that this is going to work out. Yeah, I, th- I think it was kind of like him walking the line a little bit. Like, okay, I got to fortify my position as a communist here, but I also don't want to fuck it up with a new administration. Like, play nice, but be clear on where I stand. Yeah, and also, but Hathaway also like said like, Marcel is against against the fourth withdrawal. And so that's one reason how the way it's like, okay, that yeah. gives me a little bit but more. So was Boric <laughs> right now. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> but I think that, again, as a finance minister, if yeah. you're not behind what Boric is saying, like, I think that gave a little bit more credence to what he's doing, at least in, in what Holloway sa- mm-hmm. says. He says, I was never in favor of the withdrawal either, was never in favor of workers paying the cost of the crisis with their own saying. Apparently, Marcel was never against any of the withdrawals from the IFPs, and neither was Holloway. Yeah. Because they shouldn't take from their own savings, which, right. Yeah, apparently, he also has a lot of experience uh, with the IFP system, like, uh, at least like the spokesperson, what's the phrase? Uh, Alejandra Cox, who's into like the a, into the mic. I'm going to remind you. The spokesperson of the the president of the AFP Association or something like that, Alejandra Cox, she also saying like high praise on Marcel. And she also said like he knows the AFP system inside out, which Perfect. is just critical, crucial with everything coming for, down for the road now. For what Boric wants to do, yeah. which is completely overhaul everything, he has to know it. And he seems like he knows his stuff. Like like I said, like I had, I even edited this. That's the thing is I was like, I'm not going to read <laughs> Too all. Too much. I even edited it, everything I was going to say. And there's still like three paragraphs that he didn't get into about his just constant involvement in in different sectors working with different budgets director of this budget director of that budget executive secretary to this budget company all of these things so good sign you know um i think thumbs up i think it's a good thing i mean if anytime you can please multiple parties with multiple like ideas of how the economy should go in a finance minister i think that's a good sign personally yep so, anything else you had on Marcelo? Marcel, not Marcelo, Marcel. Yeah, no, no, not really. Mario. Happy, but yeah, there were... I mean, I looked over the ministers that you were going to cover, and I think Marcel is the one that I also took like took the most notes on, on things that I was like, okay, she might not cover that, but there's just like so much to say about there's this so guy. There's so much. Yeah. There's so much. Like, I mean, which weirdly enough, I, he he has his own Wikipedia page, which isn't that common for ministers in Chile in English. A Wikipedia page in oh, okay, English, okay, okay, gotcha. Yeah, which is not that like common. So if you are interested in all of his experience, you can Wikipedia him. It's in English. So who do you got for me? Who are you covering? Well, I'm covering Iskia Siches. Yeah, Siches. Iskia Yasvin Siches Pasten. We like, talked about her before. Yep. But she's the interior minister now, so mm-hmm. she she's a lot more important. Yeah. Now, she is 34 years, th- th- 35 years young, born in Arica, and used to be a member of the Communist Youth Party, uh, Com- Communist Party Youth Organization, if you will. Yeah, like, and she was the campaign manager for Boric af- during hi- after the prime during the uh, the election. The, the election, right? Like, right. she's the mother of one, one daughter called Kala K H L A A. So, well, what's with the extravagant names in that family? Like, maybe they're Mapunungun because she's Mapuche. I think Kala sounds a little bit she's more. Mapuche? No, she's not. No, that you're thinking of. Um, Proste. No, Proste is no, not Mapuche from either. From the north. From maybe it's Quechua then. Yeah. No, 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 but actually, I think, or? it's probably. No, Iskia, Iskia is actually an invented name. They said this on the, they put this on the Wikipedia site that it's like a like amalgamation of a Croatian word and something else. A very Venezuelan. A lot of Venezuelans have like combination names from their family. Yeah. Well, her mom is called Miriam, so there we go. Miriam. <laughs> yeah, the mom Iskia Sitch's mom is called Miriam. Media. No, Miriam. Miriam. Ah, m- ah! It was like media. Wow, no. that is a weird name. No, okay, media, that. media. So anyway, so Is- Iskia's daughter is called Kala, which sounds Indian to me. Like, you know, I, I don't know shit, but it sounds Indian to like me. Like from the country, right? Yeah, yeah, from the country, okay. India. Like, <laughs> okay. Yeah, thanks. So that. She is a trained surgeon from the Universidad de Chile. She also holds a Master of Public Health, also from the Universidad de Chile. And she Woo-hoo. did work at the Hospital San Juan de Dios in Quinta Normal, where she specialized in the treatment of HIV-positive patients. She's you know, a badass. Which, uh, she's a badass. She is also the ex-president of the Colmet, the Colegio Medico. 
explain to our viewers slash listeners what that is. Yeah, the kulmit is. Uh, yeah, good question. What I- that is kind of like an association of of, um, of medics right. that give public policy advice, if you will. It's union adjacent. Yeah. So the Kulmit, the Colegio Medico, is union adjacent, as we just agreed upon. It's kind of like a body of uh, but association it's very, of very, very respected. medical professionals, very respected, mm-hmm. who also tend to give policy advice to governing authorities and so on. And a uh, funny thing, I didn't know that, even though I should have known that, when she got elected president of the Kulmit, she <laughs> was 53%. She ousted the then incumbent Enrique Paris, who right now is health minister. <laughs> Maybe that's why uh, they have a bone to pick, you know? Well, here's the thing. A lot of and people were surprised that she wasn't yeah. put as health minister. A lot of people were really yeah, surprised. A lot true. of people thought that she was going to be declared as the new health minister. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that is true. Maybe and she so, didn't want to do that. Who knows? I don't know. I was talking with yeah. um, with some friends about it, and they were like, well, maybe she's just a little bit more ambitious. Like, she wants something. Yeah. Could be something else, something not medical related. Yeah. yeah, I could give voice to critics because, you know, like, she does have and she does have a lot of experience in that field and that kind of you know makes her the the woman for the job in a way then it is something it is a very she does not have experience in terms of you know internal policy i mean i mean life experience sure but not training yeah such. that so unlike you know marcel she doesn't have that long list of things i mean exactly. in in this particular department yeah, like yeah, with yeah. with medical things you could definitely yeah. like i think a lot of people were surprised yeah. Wait, but heavy, ways. heavy is the shoulders. What is it? Heavy is the head that wears the crown, the crown of the medical professionals oh, in, in the, the COVID the heavy era. Heavy is the shoulders that wears the gown. The medical scrub. No, that doesn't. Laboratory work. coat. But I mean, imagine, imagine <laughs> so if somebody came to you and was like, "Would you be like to be the health minister of Chile during sure. COVID?" I would be like, "Hell no! no. Yeah. <laughs> I would rather die yeah. from COVID." Yeah. So. Well, so she got she ousted back then Enrique Paris as the president of the that's, whole thing, and she hot. she was actually and she became the youngest ever president of the government and also the first female president. So cool. Go Iskia. Now she garnered the public's attention in 2020 when she, in her role as the president of the government, commented on the government's work in handling the pandemic, making suggestions and elaborating protocols herself to better contain the spread of the wi- virus. A virus. And it's the, the, vi- the virus. <laughs> and at some point, she actually became so popular that it, she was being traded as a possible presidential candidate at yeah. some point, which was kind of like they put that to sleep because of lack of experience. But right. it has been. A th- well, it was a thing. I r- when I remember, so my boyfriend, all of his group of friends, and I mentioned this on a podcast before, like they were, they are friends with Boric. They, they came from the same university. They're like l- less than a degree of separation. I'm one degree of separation. From Boric, so I've never met him, unfortunately. Um, so they were talking about everybody loves her. Like, she just shits gold. Like, she's smart. She she knows how to handle herself. And he, the right, the left, they love her. And so it was so freaking smart that Boric picked her as her as the campaign manager. And not surprising at all that she's a minister. Um yeah, but just nobody expected her to end up in no, that and ministry that, and this, in particular. So c- ex- can you explain to me a little bit what her role would is? Uh, well, first and what foremost... What are her responsibilities? Well, first and f- foremost, basically taking care of domestic issues, and which is right now uh, handling the, the crisis in the South. I mean, that's not the only thing, but, right. but that's the most pertinent thing that Maybe she needs to take Maybe that's why I thought that she was, care, she was care. Mapuche, because, Could be, yeah. because of the fact that yeah could be but another thing that was that was interesting i think like she what she also did she was a fierce critic of the manjaric back uh, you remember that she they were at each other's throats at manjaric? some point <gasps> yeah you remember when manjaric was still oh health minister oh my gosh that's like a memory were, from the blocked out year of 2020 yeah like they were at each other's throat i mean and that's where she really became it, it stood in the line i remember light. that 2020 yeah. if if you were not here in chile in 2020 you do not know we all have a collective blackout yeah. from the eight months we were chained to our apartments and our homes i don't remember anything from that year i finished a lot of playstation games i read a lo- i read about like 74 books oh god you're so such an intellectual i mean they were all like smutty fairy porn no that's actually not true i read a lot of books about like public policy and yet there and yet here i am i can't articulate any of that shit at all because it goes in one eyeball and out the other 
Because of reading. That's how sound that's, travels. Okay. No, I'm, I'm reading. I don't know how oh, that. Okay, and then like. I'm like, gotcha. I want to be smart, and so I like read all these books about smart things, and then I forget it immediately. Also, Just, I read know, it in 2020. Pass out so. on the couch and have a little drool right <laughs> and so now nowadays i'm just sticking to like fairy porn because you know i don't need to remember it just enjoy it at the time yeah, fair enough fair enough okay so back to she, ministers back to that and she was also like i mean just summing up the accomplishments here she has in 2021 she was named as one of the times 100 next emerging leaders worldwide i mean Heck get yeah. that get that from the times she's, she's badass magazine. yeah so she has already been invited by several interest groups to visit the southern macro zone as they call it basically where the where the little almost civil war is raging down there to get a first-hand impression of the ongoing conflict which includes the victims of the violence as well as well as the for, for, for listeners i yeah. think it's important because we have a lot of listeners from the u.s so this is yeah. the the conflict between the indigenous people mm. Um, who are trying to take back their land and uh, corporations and people who are not indigenous who are living in that area. Mm -hmm. So there's a big conflict going on, a huge conflict actually yeah, happening. We should, we should, I know we, you covered that already in the before times. We can, we we can we cover it in more detail. Again, a bit yeah. more detail because I think that's an interesting issue to cover. Yeah, I think, I think that would be a good thing yeah. to cover. So a lot of people hope that she has a different handling on the situation of the situation than Pineda did. And as well, things mean. appear that she is a lot more able to you know, extend her hand dialogue, even though the state of exception in the South has been prolonged for like, what, two weeks now? That has been passed in Congress yes. like two days but ago. But Boric has said he's not going to extend it. Yeah, and that might actually, if he extends it again, that might, ooh, shit's going to come down. Boric like, won't, he, he already said he won't extend it. And uh, something uh, something to note, uh, Sichez is already, Sichez and typically the Boric's government have are more on the side of the indigenous people than Piñera's government, who yeah. are more on the side of the corporations. So there is going to be a different type of dialogue going on, yeah. hopefully. So I think she also, and correct me if I'm wrong, also, I also think she's the first woman to have this position yeah. of interior minister, which prompted our f everybody's favorite person, Juan Suti, <laughs> to, just, oh my God. <laughs> to just give of an absolutely terrible comment. Because when asked about Sitges doing an interview, uh, when asked about Sitges <gasps> while during an interview with oh the Radio Universo, God. Suti said, she, and I quote here, she definitely uh, has a pair of legs and a set of hips that should be more than enough to hash out agreements. I'm so angry and right now. I was like, what I the fuck? I cannot <laughs> believe this piece of shit. Like, this is 2021, people. Like, 2022. This is not, this even, like, this, this even shouldn't have happened. Okay, first of all, you shouldn't even think that. Second of all, why would you fucking say that? Like, what? How small is this motherfucker's dick? That's what I want to know. Like, ah, okay. Some picks. Ah, small dick so, sink ships, as they say. Yeah, and he People got, say that? He got <laughs> raked over the coals for that, and rightfully so. <clears throat> oh my like, gosh. I, I always wonder, like, doesn't he have someone, like, an assessor? You would think I mean, you would think the right wing would have them, but I swear to God, the right wing is yeah. like, you're great, you're great, baby. Yeah, like just someone say, just some one person to say, like, I don't, I don't think the right has that, that at that. all. I, I, I think he hired the one that Pineda had before. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I'm like, does the right not have like a person? Yeah. The, guy, the guy who who uh, told Pineda to go take the picture in Bagadano. No, the, the mm. you gotta tell the other side. Well, the one that told Pinera to ride while he was in Germany, Deutschland. Okay, so I've got the next person, Nicolas Andres Grau Veloso, who is the Ministerio de Economía, Fomento y Turismo, which is Minister of Economy, Development, and Tourism. So. What this guy do? So the mission of the Minister of Economy is to promote the modernization and competitiveness of the productive structure of the country, private initiative, and the efficient action of the markets, the development of innovation, and the consolidation of the international insertion of the country's economy in order to achieve sustained and equitable growth through the formation of policies, programs, and instruments that facilitate the activity of the productive units of the country and their corporate organizations and institutions related to the productive and technological development of the country, but public and private, national and foreign. Okay, that's from the Chilean <laughs> website. <laughs> <laughs> they are supposed to stimulate the economy. That's what they're supposed to do. Um, lots of stimulation. 
for the, co the economy internally and externally. Basically, that's the idea. So, Nicolas Andres Grau. So, he is 35. He has a master's and a doctorate in economics. He is also a teacher at the Universidad de Chile Department of Economy, um, lovingly known as Fitch. And it's considered probably the best university in the country for economics, um, if not just undoubtedly the best. So he was actually president of Fitch while he was there. He's a member of the Social Convergence Party, which is the same party that Boric is a part of, in the Frente Amplio Coalition, of course. Um, and they're reportedly close friends, and he has been an advisor of Bor an advisor to Boric for many years, as Boric has been a dep diputado on economic matters. So, Grau has caused a few quote unquote controversies already, which before he was in his new position, and I say controversies quote unquote because they're only controversies from the perspective of the right wing parties, because he's created some controversial proposals. For example, he believes that. On all companies, 50% of the board of directors should be the workers of the companies. And the right really did not like that. And it, he had some harsh criticism, Ooh, of, criticism of that. And so he sort of backed off on trying to like push that. Grau is also very close with Daniel, Daniel Hadoué, which is really interesting. So he's sort of bridging this Boric Hadoué gap. As I mentioned earlier, that Hadoué is the... Mayor of Recoleta, he's a communist. He's very popular in the Communist Party. He ran for president, um, narrowly lost to Boric, um, and he's very close with both of them. So he sort of um, discusses economic policies with both Hadoué and Boric. Um, but that specifically other. because he has a good relationship with Hadoué, and just because of that, this this report says makes right wingers very uncomfortable because he has a a relationship or a French or an advisory sort of relationship yeah. with a communist. Yeah. Um, he's actually the son of Michel Bachelet's former minister, Paulina Veloso. And um, okay. okay, so the but the reason why this is important is because he is a huge and harsh critic of Bachelet's government. Oh, okay. Right. So Michel Bachelet was president before Piñera and then also before Piñera again. She's been president twice on and off between the Pineda government. Like Pineda. <laughs> right. Um, she is moderate left. A lot. Some people would say she's moderate. Some people would say she's moderate left, depending on who you ask. Leftists don't like her. Moderates yeah. think she's too left. She's left of center. Yeah, she's left of center. Um, so he's actually um, a harsh critic of her coalition. Um, so that's pretty interesting. So... He outlines his main priorities, and he wants to specifically focus on recovering the dynamic, um, the dynamic, it says the dynamism of sectors, so um, stimulating specifically things hit hard by the pandemic, such as tourism, and he wants to recover investments that the pandemic um, has sort of drained international and national investments and he wants to also pump a lot of things into the public sector like pump a lot of support into the public sector so it says the government's goal is to initiate and begin to materialize the productive transformations proposed by Boris's program which aim to quote overcome stagnation and resume economic dynamism taking advantage of natural resources in a way that is compatible with the environment and promoting research and innovation to generate new sectors. So this is important because Boric's government really wants to focus a lot on the resources, copper, fruit, lithium, which we're going to have a whole episode about lithium, but they want to do it in a way that is like uh, environmentally friendly. Like they don't want to just create... Um, they don't just want to wipe out like forests and stuff for the sake of economic growth which is something that cast really <laughs> wanted to do so his thing is we definitely want to take advantage of these things these natural resources in a way that is sustainable and environmentally friendly so uh, his idea is to design a national strategy for a greener more inclusive economy which requires both financing including strengthening Corfo and advancing to a development bank and also doubling spending on R&D 
today, I don't know what that means. Research, research and development. Research, yeah. Today at 0.4% GDP and lowest in the OECD. Meh. So Sorry. we'll talk about more specifics about natural resources such as lithium in our next episodes. But lithium is going to be a big thing because Boric, because Pineda's government really, really wanted to privatize lithium. And Boric wants to nationalize a part of that lithium to pump this money back into Chile. And uh, Boric also wants to focus on green hydrogen to take that money into the public sector. So all of this stuff is going to be the responsibility of Grau to uh, negotiate and to figure out a way to finance and um, encourage national and international investors on these fronts. A lot of responsibilities. Yep. Oh, man. And he's 35. I am 30, <laughs> and this motherfucker, like, has done so much. <laughs> like, Don't even look at me, man. <laughs> Like, dude. I mean, then again, Boric is 35, and he's yeah. the president of a country. So if you weren't feeling bad today. Yeah. yeah. But it's not all young people. Oh, not all it's young, not pe young people. people you have an oldie government. coming up? Well, got an oldie, good, oldie, an oldie good goodie. Talking about Maria Begonia Yarsasaz, who's going to be the future health minister, minister of health. Okay, so now we get the, the minister yeah. of health. They we're just basically health ministry, public policy, of, you know. What? Health Paris things, doing, which Paris is doing right for now, those of you who and know who that is. which this is right now the health ministry is one of the also the key ministries right now because uh, you might not have noticed that, but we're in the middle of a pandemic, so yeah, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah, because she's the one basically calling the shots in terms of policies, countermeasures. Uh, are we going back into lockdown or not? That that's going to be on her at this point now. She's 70, uh, 70, no, 57 oh, years Jesus. old. I was like, wow. Well, there's one person that... Oh, I have him. Yep, I know. <laughs> We're getting mm, suspense. <laughs> so she's 57 oldie. years old. She was born in Rengo, you know, which is also... <laughs> Rengo, you know? Rengo, you know? Now, Iskia Sitches, she was born in Riga. She's born in Rengo. I got another one coming up who's born in Rancao, which also speaks to uh, Boric's cabin composition of being... Having a lot from of people the from the, from from the, the regions, regions, which is basically not from the capital which city. Which I personally think is great because it really reflects like the just a whole cross section all of what of Chile. Chile is. And, yeah. and that is so, and a lot of people from the regions are very proud of being from the regions, yeah. but it's a completely different life. If you come and visit Chile and you go to Santiago or Viña, they're amazing places, but they're not representative of the majority of the country and their lives and the those people from those parts of the country need to feel represented. So, yeah, her being born in Rengo. In 1973, she went with her family into political exile, first to Argentina, then Cuba. Cuba. And then she came back to Chile in 1988, studied medicine at the University Universidad de Havana in Cuba. Nice. Became a surgeon at the Uni Universidad de Chile in 1991 and also got a Master of Public Health in the Spanish University of Pompeo Fabra. So, yeah, she Damn got woman. a lot of education. She has a lot of experience in the health sector, as we will see, because she is also an active collaborator of the Colmet and therefore has close ties with Iskia Yeah. She used to work as a subdirector of the Hospital San Borgia Arriaran from 2008 to 2009, and then was also the director of she was also the director of the Hospital Ezequiel González Cortés from 2009 to 2018, so almost 10 years. And she has been credited with making it the first public hospital to win the Health Superintendent's Quality Accreditation wow. for two consecutive years. Oh, so, great. And then uh, until recently, she worked at the um, Clinica Santa Maria, or as I used to call it, the CSAM. As a uh, gerente de Cali... Hold on, you didn't get that? No, I don't get it. The CSM. Oh. Is usually abbreviation for what? She oh. Yeah. I was like CSM. And I'm not yeah. okay. Side Coach sidebar sidebar here. Like that until recently, thing until a few years ago, that was actually <laughs> the website of the Clinica Santa no, Maria. It was like, yep, no, yeah. It was like you get to CSM.cl and you get to clean. It was like really no, nobody has nobody has noticed that and they've changed of it. Of course they had noticed. But it. I think. But you know what? Good publicity. But you know what? I think I bet my. I'm actually, I'm gonna try right now. I'll go www.csm. They're probably gonna forward you to see Santa Maria or something. Honestly, best best yeah, advertising. Yeah, Clinica Santa Maria. You just get forwarded to Clinica Santa Maria. Best CRM, advertising absolutely. ever. CSM. Dot, now do CTM.cl. See where it takes oh, you. Boy, if it's porn. I'm so yeah. sorry. 
Yeah. So yeah, keep him under the city. Yeah. Sí, sí, so she worked at this Clinica Santa Maria as a gerente de calidad y gestión, so basically quality, uh, quality and process control. Mm -hmm. And uh, voices have really highlighted her experience in the public health system, something that ex-health minister Manjelic, for example, did mm -hmm. not have and heavily criticized for. Now, make no mistake, Manjelic, he was also, he's also a uh, physician, he's a doctor, he's a health professional. The thing is that he doesn't have the same chops as Begonia in, in as far as that he has, as far as I know, mostly worked for private institutions. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the big points that he has been criticized for. He does not know the quote-unquote reality of the Chilean right. people. Which is, I think there was this one... If you've only ever been to private hospitals, yeah, the, the, the reality of private hospitals versus public hospitals in Chile is just so starkly different. Yeah, there was this, this one interview that he was heavily criticized for where he was oh man, I, I don't quite remember what it was but he was just like well i had no idea it was like that and oh everybody yes. was just like how did how you, did you like, it's your know. job to know right at some you you can have your past experience but once you get hired at something especially when it is infects infects what affects the well, lives that too well yeah exactly <laughs> infects the lives of of people you take a tour of the public hospital talk to people who work at public hospitals talk to people i don't understand see that's yeah. never that's always been the fault of the right in chile is they're so disconnected from what's actually going on there's been so many ministers in this that have been like oh i didn't realize people don't only made that much money i didn't really we really don't have a core what do you mean so yeah that's probably not going to happen with uh, maria begonia because i mean she got around she has she holds titles from several universities in several countries she has worked in the public health se sector in several places uh i mean can't nobody say that she ain't not she ain't not no one she ain't not no one ain't going on in this country well i mean that and Boric <laughs> promises to strengthen the public health system too because uh well first of all he wants to sort of merge public and private in a lot of ways um but he knows and it is true that the public system is just over there's not enough money put into it for it to be sustainable does he want to merge it though i think he wants to leave it to everybody's choice in a he way. does but he want what he wants to do is he he wants to take money from the private yeah. hospitals think line. He want, yeah, okay, so no, he definitely wants to leave it up to choice, but he wants to sort of have this idea of um, taking money from the private hospitals to finance the public, and, uh, public hospitals because the private hospitals make so much fucking money hand over fist. Mm -hmm. No, 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 well, what he's saying is that, like, that's his idea, that everybody should be Yeah, everybody in is in FONASA, and, and if, then you pay you extra it, yeah, to sure, be in yeah. Inisabre. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, because you are you are yes or yes contributing to the public system. Right. Right, which I think is a great idea. Yeah, I mean, duh. you're gonna get your isapre. You're gonna get isapre is the private like insurance. You're gonna get your isapre, but you're also contributing to the public system because what's happening is people that are in isapres have all the. I mean, what is eighty five percent of Chile or more are in Fonasa, and so we have. I'm pretty sure it's eighty five percent, something like that. I wrote an article about it recently, and or like a year ago. Um, and so all of the money, the majority of all of that big, those big bucks are staying again in just the richest people and not going anywhere. So I think that's a great idea, personally. Word, word. Word, word, word up. So that's her. Who you got next? Oh, Carlos Eduardo Montes Cisternas. He is the Ministro de Vivienda y Urbanismo, which is the Minister of Housing and Urbanism, which I think for me is important, for me personally, because fucking housing in this city is insane so <laughs> don't even get me started on don't urbanism. even get me started okay so uh, from the government website the mission of the minister of housing is to enable access to quality housing solutions and contribute to the development of equitable integrated and sustainable neighborhoods and cities all under the criteria of decentralization participation and development with the purpose that in individuals families and communities improve the, the quality of life and increase their well-being where has the fucking minister of vivienda and urbanismo been under fucking piñera like it literally says your entire job is to make sure people have a good quality of life and have places to live in equitable housing where have you been on vacation i don't know i'm like what what that's literally your job and people are like we have like ah oh, okay sorry <laughs> okay so, um, 
Carlos Montes himself was trained as an economist at the Universidad Católica, um, and he was exiled to Mexico during the dictatorship. Um, but that was after he was actually arrested and tortured because he was in the Socialist Party. And he still is in the Socialist Party, which is actually like a big deal because the Socialist Party has changed a lot and a lot of left like for example we've talked about before the socialist party was not invited to the frente amplio the leftist coalition that Boric is in because they have a lot of controversy surrounding them right now um and he's sort of one of these people that's like good old socialists in the way that he, i mean kind of semantics pinguino okay so the socialist party was invited if they were now some of their members but they wouldn't so they weren't invited anymore okay yes so there you go so, um, be- again, as I was saying, the Socialist Party is very controversial. For a lot of reasons, they won't renounce some of their members that have been accused of, like, financial misdealings, bad behavior in different ways in their personal lives. Anyway, but um, Montes is considered, like, one of the, like, original socialists, like, Allende kind of guy, which Red makes sock. sense. Yeah, which makes sense. He's 75 years old. He's, he's you know, he's old. He's the oldest of the cabinet. He is the oldest of yeah. the entire cabinet. Um, and so he was exiled to Mexico after his uh, arrest and torture. Um, and he was actually a professor at many of the universities in Mexico. Um, he actually started his political experience at the age of 15 He was a neighborhood leader of the Student Federation, um, and he very much like Boric. Boric Exactly. (laughs) And he ended up founding a group called the United Popular Action Movement, MAPU, when he was young. MAPU? They're really well known. (laughs) Oh, he founded it. Because I think the agriculture minister was also part of it. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, He said he was part of the founding of... Founding of the group. Mapu, they, did, they used to do a lot of direct action. Cool. Apparently, like, Mapu is a very important organization that I didn't know about until just don't now. Don't tell me that's not a backronym. Like, that's no coincidence. It's Mapu. Mapu, I highly doubt it. it. It's a coincidence. Yeah. Like, as in Mapuche. Just, you know. uh, no, I, I, yeah. No, no, but, you know, listeners. They're probably like poor, poor, I don't think they're, he's recording this part. Oh, I actually am. I mean, I don't think he's going to keep this part of us oh, just, okay. like, talking to each other. No, but, like, what's this guy's name? Mon- um, Carlos Montes? Montes. Carlos yeah, so Montes. Carlos Montes was probably, like, up, like, for, like, weeks trying to, like, come. Okay, so, <laughs> he's the M here. The it says he was part of the founding, name, so he probably was, like, a group of, like, four people or he something. He was, like, five people, like, all week. Like, he was, like, okay, forces so of work. <laughs> yeah. The a, not- the a could be autonomous. <laughs> yeah. Action. Action. Okay, so after he returned to Chile from uh, Mexico, he led the No campaign in the 1988 plebiscite in the metropolitan region. I didn't know that. He's a really cool, experienced dude. The No campaign was the campaign to return to democracy, if you didn't know. And he was one of the founders of the PPD, Party for Democracy. In Congress, he has been dialoguing with parliamentarian and for many years and he has never according to this article he's been somebody that has never hesitated to harshly represent his opinions when it um when it refers to critical exchanges specifically with uh, the budget director in 2021 in the treasury debate um do 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 oh so as i said he's considered quote unquote a good socialist <laughs> because like it's the Socialist Party is pretty controversial on both sides. Um, he most recently he was the president of the Senate between 2018 and 19, and he was also a deputy, which is like a representative to the government, which is what Boric was from the metropolitan region between 1990 to 2014. A long time. Then he became a senator right after. So since he has been involved in politics for so long, he has debated all the structural transformations that Congress has approved since the recovery of democracy, such as tax, education, and pension reform, among others. So one of his uh, reiterated themes in the budget discussions has been to promote public investment, where the housing portfolio that he will now head plays a key role. In recent negotiations of the 2022 budget, 
the opposition and the government agreed to double the subsidies to build homes, bringing them to 50000 this year in order to advance in reducing the housing deficit, now pressured by the rise in camps in the pandemic because there is a lot of um, homeless camps that have sprouted up during the pandemic for obvious reasons. Um, so... Mm -mm -mm -mm. Montes will be working very closely with the finance minister who already, I already just talked about, Mario Marcel, um, since they are one is structuring the economy while the other is structuring housing. So they're going to be working very close together. Um, Boric has a housing emergency plan that they're both going to be working on where this is the use of land for housing purposes is prioritized and the creation of state companies for the production of construction materials and popular hardware stores to reduce costs to the public so like the things to produce housing and houses if you want to build them reducing those costs and uh in addition to the portfolio's own issues it will be up to him to deal with the pro probable incorporation of the rights to housing in the new magna carta so this is something that is coming up really in the um New Magna Carta, the idea of housing as a human right. So there we ho there we ho. What? There we, there go. we go. That's Nicolas Grau, he's seventy five no. years young. No, nope, Nicolas not Grau. Oh shit. Montes, Carlos yeah. Montes. <laughs> seventy five years young. I just talked about Nicolas Grau uh, it's earlier. Late. It's late. It's um past my bedtime. Um, Nicholas Grau is the Minister of Economy. This is Carlos Montes, the Minister of Housing. Nice. There you go. Well, lucky you that my research wasn't as thorough as yours on the candidates, so it's not going to be that long. <laughs> no. I, got the last I mean, one did here. you have any comments on Montes? Nope. Oh, okay. Nope, not at all. <laughs> None? I think you covered everything. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> because I haven't really done research on Montes at all. Eh? No. Like, the only thing that I knew about this guy was he's old. Oh, he old. But it's like he's like I like that there's somebody from Allende's like circle that is now in the government. I mean, I think this is a very interesting part of like the historical circle yeah. we're living in right now. Mm -hmm. And he seems very experienced and Well, it better be he old. <laughs> God. I mean, he's been working since he was 15 and he's now 75, so I hope he knows what the fuck he's doing. Yeah, he so <laughs> Okay. What do you got now? Yeah. Well, I got one more, which is Esteban Manuel Valenzuela van Trek, who is going to be the agriculture minister. I guess there's some Dutch in there. Van Trek, I would say, I guess. He is uh, 57 years old. Mm -hmm. He is from Rancao, which makes him a Rancawino or Rancawino. Well, I will Rancawino. say Rancawa is the Rancawino. city my boyfriend hates the most in this whole country. Why? Because... Oh, nobody cares about this because their um oh, their municipal no their municipality is really fucked up with how they do like law stuff. It's boring law stuff. Like like he has to go there in person to like oh. hand over things because they refuse to accept like faxes or oh, like emails. <laughs> that sounds like my home country. <laughs> I heard that about Germany recently too. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I thought you guys were supposed to be on top of the engineering and mm -hmm. things, but not bureaucracy. But that's a different thing. So, Mr. Esteban Valenzuela, he is a journalist and a political scientist by training. He, used he to is be the minister of what? Of agriculture. Agriculture. Doing agricultural things. Okay. Doing things everything with plants. Plants. And animals and farms and moo, moo and Oink. sprout and <laughs> everything. Moo and sprout. All them stuff. So, he's doing that. I'm, you can see I'm a professional. Mm -hmm. We both are. Have we you, both if, are. If, you, if you're just <laughs> tuning in to us for the first time... We do this because we love Chile and we love talking about this stuff. We are not professionals. If you want professionals, check out our news affiliate, Chile Today point dot point dot CL. Mm, otherwise, you better be happy with Moo yeah, and Sprout. Yeah, with, with <laughs> Moo and Sprout. That needs to be our band That's name. Be <laughs> Moo and Sprout. <laughs> All right. So, Moo and Sprout. He used to be mayor of Rancagua between 92 and 96. Long time ago in the before times. Mm -hmm. And he also was a deputy in the lower house between 2002 2010 and was also the head of a campaign of the Presidential Assessment Commission for Decentralization and Regional, regional Development. It's really herky-jerky tra translating some of those yeah. names sometimes, yep, yep. but you know what I'm saying. So he is very much in favor of decentralization, regionalization. Jeez, makes me wonder why Boric has picked him. <laughs> That's so, right in his wheelhouse. So specifically, what is like specifically like the decentralization of santiago 
no, no, what no, are you no. talking about? Of Chile, like he basically he is a big advocate or advocate of basically have giving regions bigger autonomy and also uh, giving the regions like bigger autonomy in terms of like agriculture and everything else. Okay, know? yeah, yeah, okay. So yeah, so because sometimes decentralization when you're talking about Santiago specifically means like this. Oh shit, <laughs> just hit the mic. Uh, well, specifically the the housing minister I just talked about is like encouraging decentralization of Santiago, meaning getting people out of Santiago and being able to live in other regions uh, also. No, that, so that's yeah, why I was I mean, asking. I mean, that he might also be in support of that, but I don't think that's what that article means. No, so. no, no. I was just questioning. So yeah, so uh, there've been a few positive voices already that. W- we're very happy and very satisfied with the appointment. Also, like the, the, the Fede Fruta, which is the Fruit Producers Federation, they were like, hey, hey, Ray, you know, we like this person here. However, he did only receive lukewarm support from his own FRVS party. As when he, was not when the, he joined the ministry. He, because When he was appointed, because he was not the candidate that the party had put forward. Uh-huh. Like, honestly, when I read up on most of like, I mean, I did a cursory reading up on all the candidates and all the ministers. And he was really the only one that, like, right out of, like, right off the bat received, like, a bunch of criticism. Because that was one thing. And the other thing is that, um, um, oh, hold on, let me just go back to the whole thing. Rewind. The, yeah, rewind. Oh, 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 oh. Well, so basically, yeah, what I'm saying is he only re- received lukewarm support from the Frente Regional Verde Socialista. I think it's it's uh, yeah, it's like it's one of the coalition parties. It, he was not the candidate that they put forward. And according to Alejandra Sepulveda of that very same party, he does not have the technical chops to fill the position of Minister of uh, Agriculture. Maybe she's just butt hurt. Well, maybe she's butt, but she has got a point. I mean, he is a journalist and a political scientist by training. He got nothing to do with agriculture. You know what I'm saying? So basically, he's not a technocrat in that sense. Do we know why Boric picked him? Uh, I do not know why Boric picked him. I don't know if anybody else knows why Boric picked him, but uh, I want all of the information, Boric. Yeah, Boric, do something. Com- I mean, literally, I think this Boric. man has not took it, taken a nap in six not. months. Well, he's still trying pick, picking out Every the subsecretaries, day, but that's a different thing. I've subscribed to his tweets. I get like I'm still waiting for him to tweet me about wanting English classes, but um, I subscribe to his tweets, and he tweets so much. He tweeted about Taylor Swift the other day. I know. I saw. I know. I sent it to you. I know. I saw. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's been another thing going on. Coming back to the candidate at hand, to the minister at hand, um, there's currently a libel suit against him. Oh, Jesus. When he, like, disparaged against, like, an avocado farmer in a 2020 video uploaded to his Twitter account, allegedly comparing his land to a concentration camp <gasps> and calling him a racist delinquent belonging to a mafia and accusing him of being corrupt and threatening to even call the cops on this guy. So, okay, as far as I know, he didn't hold office my in fa- What does my face look like right now? Uh, shocked. Okay, you're not good at adjectives. That's fine. But it's shocked, right? <laughs> no. Well, s- sarcastically shocked, I guess. No, no, I because, was. I mean, it's like, a, I was shocked. Yeah, but, you know, it's, that is it's, not an, good. it's an avocado farmer, so him calling out avocado farmers is kind of like, okay, I can see where he's coming from. Yeah, but avocado still, farmers tend to be, you know, more like right wing. Hogging water. <laughs> I mean, literally, like we joked a, mi- a few minutes ago about how, like, we in- we're now talking about, like, limiting our water that yeah. we have in chile mm-hmm. so it's that Santiago. they can use it to yeah. sell avocados to europe i mean they, they didn't like uh, claudio rego did like the big boss of the santiago region he didn't rule out water rationing in santiago like yeah. get a load of that <laughs> yeah yeah so it's like yeah it's, it's ridiculous yeah, like i mean if you live like up north like in the the desert or something like that i'd be just like okay that was to be expected but like in santiago like damn mm-hmm. you know <coughs> when they asked him about his mistakes, didn't he like? Yeah, didn't he say like, "Oh, I stuck by it." About, I mean, about the, 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 the guy. Yeah. Well, he said that. Um, what was the thing? Put the mic. I want to hear. The, yeah, the people want to know. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I'm just. Uh, what was it? Because I think he sa- he stood by because he said that these people actually threatened him, but then that was dismissed in court because he had no way of proving it. Okay, now, point being, as, as I said, as far as I know, he didn't hold office at that point, but he was a person Still. of public interest. You got to watch your mouth. And actually, oh, that's one of that the reasons. Okay. And that's, that's, that's one that of... That was Mouse Lenny coming out. You got to watch your mouth. Was that? <laughs> what was that coming out? <laughs> okay, anyway. Anyway, yeah, so no, no, yeah. When you're, and that's actually one of the reasons that I picked this guy, because like he was actually one of the few 
ministers that didn't really get a, like that didn't really have a smooth start there like right out of the gate he was just like his own party was just like yeah i just didn't really the one that we put and then well, i mean all of i don't sudden, really like, care about like, what parties put forward because like pe parties have their own interest of why they're going to put a certain candidate yeah. forward and i would rather board each make his own decisions not be pressured I mean, by parties no, i'm absolutely with you it's just but if you compare it to like this guy like uh, uh, Marcel and Grau yeah we've been talking about all these people that like, are like, like oh this is oh, such a so great bad. choice like <laughs> applaud dude, you this Mr. dude and then this guy's just like yeah you're not getting applause from everybody so that was kind of like I don't want to say it's a miss but it's just like it's an outlier there mm -hmm, totally so yeah and he's not been the only one so yeah that that would be that would be my guys I think we do need to have make a before we wrap this up we have to have, have a quick mention of of some of the other ones. Yeah, and I'm the actually part of the Troika, Camila Vallejos. Camila, she is, if you don't know, she is my girl crush who I want to be in my life, who I can't be. She is um, the voice of, what is it called in Spanish? Well, she's now the, the general secretary of the government. Spokesperson. Yeah, she's the spokesperson, and she is okay. 33 years young. Um, she Child. she's only thirty three. How long? How old was she when she first became a diputado? I don't know. Eight. Jesus. Eight. Okay, know. so she went to university. She was actually in university at the time. Forty is in a university. They've had a long history together. She is part of the Communist Party. She is absolute. This is not related to anything at all. But she's absolutely breathtakingly gorgeous. Yeah, she had. She is amazing, and she is going to be the spokesperson for. Um, for him, we all knew she was going to be in the in something, in something yeah. because they're so and close. She recently came out to ensure that the, which I thought was remarkable, she ensured that the government will be center left. So it was, uh, you know, it was like okay, she is communist party. Oh yeah. So she like for her to say this commu this government would be will be center left, she'd probably be like like oh this hurts. You but know? Yeah, her <laughs> but teeth like, fell I gotta, out from I gotta, flinching. I gotta, I gotta do it. And I think this nomination came a little bit as a surprise because she, like remember she actually wanted to retreat from active politics. Yeah, I mean I think this is kind of a retreat. It's not like she's not being the person making any of the decisions, right? She's just being the spokesperson. So well, that makes sense, right? She's not having to be that pr in that pressured position in the same way, yeah. at least. So we have to talk about the first lady the first of the lady. of the republic, uh, Giorgio Jackson, yeah, the obviously. First <laughs> the first <laughs> dame. He is Boris's best friend. Like they've been buddies since the beginning. There are so many adorable pictures of him and Boris with hair. Uh, <laughs> well, no, Jackson with hair. Well, Jackson with hair. Well, but it's just, he, he used to have more hair and less beard. Yeah, less beard, more hair, and, and he had a mohawk at one point while he was a, still a deputy. And a few pounds less on hips, I guess. I mean, I'm fat shaming, just saying. Boric lost, has lost weight. I'm pretty sure if we're, we're going to talk years. about... Are you in this I, podcast I, or not, I'm Pinguino? I'm, pre I'm pretty sure it's just like, uh, you know, stress. Yeah, just stress. <laughs> but he's, no but time he, to have he, lunch. He has lost weight. But anyway, so... Uh, his best, bestie, best, and the best friend land um, is the minister of sec the Minister Ministerio Secretaria General de la Presidencia. Uh, he's thirty four years young. He is it's in the same days. party. Ah, nope. Yeah. Oh no, he's a rev no, he's a revolution democratic. Yeah. Democratic. He's in the Which, same coalition. Yeah. Which same is co coalition. Kind of like something I wondered about. I mean, they're besties, besties, but apparently not besties enough to have be in the same party because I think he actually founded co-founded the revolution democratica and they're very close ideologically to one another but it's just like I it always seemed odd to me that they're two different parties yeah, like the are you in this party I'm sorry, I'm sorry. are we gonna if we're you're gonna be in it we need to mic you <laughs> Great. we should Good. also give a quick shout out to maya fernandez as pinguino pointed out the other day because maya fernandez is the future um Minister of Defense, which means she is in charge of the of the army. Uh huh. However, funny tidbit about her: she is Salvador Allende's granddaughter. Yep. Salvador That's Allende being awesome. the socialist president who fell victim to the 1973 military coup led by Augusto Pinochet. So, and putting her in charge of the military of the armed forces is kind of hot. That's kind of a mic drop right there. I mean, yeah. Damn. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> that is Damn. symbolic as symbolic can get. Mm -hmm. That's, yep, yep. So there. And 
also anyone else yep i think we should go also give a little shout out to um, little marco wink. antonio avila and alexandra benaro who are going to be the minister of education I and would, yeah. the minister of sports respectively both of them are lgbtq both of them are openly homosexual and mm -hmm. are first minist ministers in chile to ever assume that position that are openly homosexual which is also a first now that being said as of today there have been a few accusations circling around uh what's her face alejandra venado for workplace harassment while she was working at the memorial museum londres uh, 38 mm -hmm. which i think is also one of the reasons that Boris right now is taking a sweet little time and even missing his self-imposed deadline and appointing the subsecretarias because he damn well wants to make sure that right, because none once of you those scandals come to right, the because surface. Because you know that scandals were going to surface. Because yeah. once, you announce, you, once you announce these ministers, the right is going to do whatever they can to discredit the... Let's be fair. The left would do the same thing. Oh, no. I'm totally... No, you're totally right. I am just saying, like, in this particular yeah, right. situation, right? So um, it's kind of like bide your time. It's good that, you know... This is not good, but of the ministers who could be um, scandalized, mm -hmm. I'm glad it's not like the minister of health or yeah. like the minister of economics. We just got for now. We got agriculture and sports. Like, who cares? Yeah, I mean, no, I mean, <laughs> I care about sports and workplace harassment a hundred percent. But um, I feel like it's a manageable problem if the allegations are true, which I don't know if they are. Um, Minister of Education, though, Marco, he's the first ever Minister of Education who actually has a degree in education. You're kidding. No, I'm not kidding. Um, so he is, um, he's a teacher. He has a master's in education and innovation. He is the ex-director ex of the Educational Establishment Ex-Coordination Ex coordinator of the Nas uh, Nas Nacional de Educación Media del Ministro de Educación. So uh, he has experience in education, which is something new in um, in Chile That's for Ministry of Education. That is crazy. So, guys, I hope you enjoyed the show today. As usual, if you have any specific questions, you can ask us. I'm not sure we're all going to know the answer, but we're happy to look into things, and Pinguino's a lot smarter than us, so maybe we'll make him look into it. You can always follow us on Instagram. We have updates daily on what's happening in Chile, um, media news and things like that. We're on Instagram at Chile Today Podcast. We also have a Facebook page, Chile Today Podcast, and you can email us, chiletodaypodcast at gmail.com. We are um, really happy that you came to listen and hope that you continue to listen to us. If you have any comments, concerns, uh, stories about your life in Chile, we want to hear them. Oh, yeah, we haven't had stories in a while. Yeah, we love hearing stories. your stories about Chile, and we might even read them on the air if you're cool with that on the air as if we're live, like a radio. But you know what I'm saying. Yeah, the canned air. Yeah, the recorded air. So, yeah, anything that you guys want, if you... Just want to reach out and say, hey, we'd love that. Yep. So um, see you guys next time. When in doubt. Gringo out. Bye. Bye.